All right, let's make sure the microphone is working. Seems like it is. My voice is a little gravelly tonight, but um, I think I'm mostly back in normal operating conditions. Um, I'll try not to cough into the you know microphone or whatever. Um, I was playing around with this trigger earlier. I thought I fixed this issue, but it's still doing it, so this is what I need to do. Make sure that I save it. Hey Sarah, how's it going? Uh, that's not the current view of the moon, no, that's just an, uh, a picture that I took. Um, I think it's maybe from two months ago. Um, I went out and took a picture, and then I I don't know if I streamed um, that particular view of the moon. You're being hypnotized. Yeah, the uh, the spinning um, actinopticus is uh, is a little hypnotizing. Um, how's everybody doing? Um, my uh, my weekend was mostly spent. Um, trying to get over a cold and now I'm it's I mean it's past but um, hey pack how's it going um, just a little shout out for Pacific plankton um, yeah so I spent most of the yeah it's kind of raspy but uh, I actually like it when it's kind of gravelly that's my um, that's my favorite form of my voice I got you get uh, some sort of extra layer of ASMR from me, I guess, tonight, as I sound like um, vocal fry the whole time, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the uh, I think the moon is currently only about a quarter full. So it would be the opposite of what's up there on the screen because it's one quarter waxing. Um, you're going for a run, oh, okay. <laughs> she's she's running on the beach. I think she'll be okay. Yeah, it's a waxing crescent right now because uh, we just went past the new moon relatively recently. We had a clear sky. And I thought I might go out and uh, I was like, oh, it looks really clear. And I went outside and I was like, oh, no, it's a new moon. <laughs> There's nothing for me to stream. So, um, yeah. <laughs> watch, watch out for, there's all kinds of things that might get you on a beach. Uh, you know, a horde of angry crabs. Um, I don't know. It could be anything, frankly. Small kids. Uh, you got to look out for them. Um, who knows what they would have laid as a trap for passerbys. So, um, this sample that I'm looking at is... Um, I'm planning on sending some stuff to um, to science, science streams. Um, bloop, bloop, bloop. This guy here, uh, Balint and... Uh, and his wife Lita and I thought it would be a good idea if I looked around in the sample a little bit and made sure that the samples that I'm sending him are reasonable um, because I made new slides and I didn't bother to look at them yet and I thought oh, I'll just take a look at them and maybe um, see how they turned out and see what's in them. Um, this, uh, this particular sample that we're looking at is from um, Marl Lake, Marl uh, Lake, Wisconsin, and um, at some point this past summer, we went on. We did some field work. My wife and I did some field work, and uh, we went through Iowa and we looped back and stopped at Marl Lake in Wisconsin. This is the lake that um, my wife's also a diatomist. And this is the, um, the lake she's currently counting. And um, 
because the vials were the samples that were in them were just on the counter, I went ahead and made my own slide of her samples, <laughs> um, just one. Um, but you know, it's there's a lot of material in there. She won't miss it, and she's already made slides from that sample, so it's not a big deal. Um, but uh, I thought, well, I could just use one of these. This might be an okay thing to send um, that they wouldn't have seen. And um, I don't spend a lot of time looking at the Morrow Lake material. Originally, it was um, a project that was started by a master's student in my lab, but the project is, um, it's one that Carlin is the principal investigator for my wife. And, um, and so she was sort of directing the, um, I was directing the student, but she was directing the research. So um, the student eventually uh, decided that they couldn't finish the project and now she's counting it as a result which sometimes happens we have to pick up the projects that our students can't finish um, because the grant doesn't care whether the student does it or you know a PI does it it just needs the work done and um, and so she's working on counting that and it's sort of a companion lake to the one that um, Addison my master's student who graduated um, who graduates this semester, um, technically, but did her defense in December, so she's been out of the lab and has a job someplace. Um, she counted the Clear Lake stuff, which was the other lake that we visited in the summer, and um, it's sort of the companion lake to those two. They're part of the same research project. Um, this thing that we're looking at in the microscope right now is uh, tabularia, and um, a tab bell area, not tabule area, but there's a bunch of little diatoms that are all around it. Um, so, let me see. I would have thought ahead, I would have pulled out the little arrow. Um, you get to hang out with one of my grad students tomorrow. You're being appreciated. Um, I'm trying to think of who you're talking about. <laughs> One of my grad students? Um, or do you mean just one from our department? Because um, my current graduate student is in Cincinnati right now at a conference, um, Laura, and she's the only one that I'm currently advising, unless you mean Addie. Um, I turned me fiery. Um, so this is Tabularia. Um, this little guy over here is an amphora. I actually don't know what species that is, but it looks like an ariensis or pediculus. Um, this is... Uh, uh, where did they move it? I think it's Samothidium. No, Ross... No, yeah, Samothidium uh, rosenstockii. And this is a... Um, Pseudostar Syra brevistrata. This is a piece, just a fragment of a Stephanodiscus. Uh, That's a girdle band. These little guys are uh, Lindavia michiganiana. This is a little uh, phytolith fragment. This is a girdle band of a diatom right here. And this is also a girdle band of a diatom. This is a girdle band of the Stephanodiscus. That's the fragment for this thing. And that is a girdle band that matches this one that is very likely the girdle band of Lindavia intermedia uh, would be my guess, and this is probably the girdle band that goes along with this little Lindavia um, Michiganina right here. Oh, Kathy. Okay, yeah, good. Kathy deserves some attention. She's a great student. Um, all right, let's uh, move around a little bit in the slide and see what else we can find. Here's some more. This is. Uh, Cyclotella michiganina, Lindavia michiganina. Um, let's see, I'm going to put some of these in here and then we'll try to look at them a little bit more closely. Um, keep in mind, I, I literally haven't looked at this slide before. So, hey Evan, how is it going? Um, how are things? We're just looking at some, uh, some... These are fixed slides, by the way. These diatoms are dead. Um, and these are old samples, so the diatoms that we're looking at are actually um, 
uh, I don't know how deep this is, about 77, let's see, that would be about 77 centimeters into the core. So these are probably from the Little Ice Age. I mean, they're, they're fossil diatoms. And um, this one is Lindavia michiganiana. And um, girdle bands don't travel too far on the slides. Well, the girdle bands are, um, they probably were attached so you know they go between the two valves and it probably was attached um, to something in the sample and they probably either snap off or fall off um, when we prep the samples or maybe while we're processing them so um, in some cases they're right, they're still attached and in some cases the girdle bands are completely detached and you'll just find the girdle band out there floating by itself um, but these are, as I mentioned, they're fixed, which means that they are hard mounted with a, um, a type of uh, epoxy that's called uh, nafrax. And um, it has a high refractive index. What that means is that um, if you were to look at these same diatoms in water, you wouldn't see nearly as much detail as you can with this because it basically modifies the um, interaction, the uh, the interaction of the light as it's passing through. So it's like it goes through the the lenses, and then it hits the oil, and then it gets into this mounting media. And it's designed to make this silicious uh, diatom skeleton basically stand out a little bit more. And so um, part of the reason these look sort of spectacular in our field of view is that my microscope is nice, and part of the reason is also that they. Um, they're mounted in a special media so you're getting settled into your new house oh that's great um, it's always kind of an interesting thing moving to someplace new um, yeah so this um, this mounting media started off as uh, something that uh, in, you know in the ancient days somebody built it using basically some kind of airplane glue or something um, but they had all kinds of different resins and materials that they tried uh, to try to figure out what had the best um, refractive index to with silica to create this sort of uh, cleaner view and then they mixed them up in a bathtub and they would just sell them in small batches to diatomists because there weren't that many diatomists and there still aren't um, but uh, uh, now it's sort of there's a website you can buy them from it's a little bit easier than trying to get somebody to make it up in a bathroom uh, for you. So um, I want to talk a little bit about this Mich uh, Michiganiana. Um, hey, Sam Chung. I sound a little different. Yeah, it's not my microphone. It's just my throat. But um, I'm, I'm gravelly. I'm vocal fry uh, because my, I've been coughing, I guess, probably is part of it. Um, but it's not completely clear from congestion. Um, but I, I feel fine, and I felt fine yesterday, actually. I just didn't want to stream because I was sniffling and, you know, like, <laughs> constantly, and uh, and then periodically I just would um, have really strong coughs. And today I'm just really, I cough a little infrequently, so I figured eh, I could probably manage it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I figure people partly are listening to me, um, you know, for the way I sound, and if my sound is sniffles and coughs they're not going to be very happy so um <sighs> dangling how are you doing um so this surface that you can see like this half of the diatom is actually in focus and this half of the diatom up here is completely out of focus and oh there i go now i'm bouncing um and the reason for that is basically because the diatom has different elevations as you move across the surface so if we were to draw a straight line um, through this and you could look at the differences in the elevation that line would be shaped like an S um, and we call that tangential undulation on the valve face um, it's a, a, a dip or um, you know this side's low elevation this side's a high elevation so you can think of it as basically like a wave a waveform moving across that surface and as a result, only part of it will be focused at any given time. So I can make the bottom part go into focus down here, 
um, and then the top part's out of focus, or I can make the top part in focus, but I can't make them both in focus at the same time. Um, and you can see that the um, this part of the diatom um, around the edge, so this is called the central area, and this is the striated area, and these are these lines are called stria. That's just a science way of saying stripes. Um, so you know. It sounds like I'm saying something really cool, but I'm just saying this is the striped area, and this part's in the middle. Um, I think you guys could probably figure that out. But um, these hard, round dots that you see right here and right here, and you can see they kind of line up on this uh, on this edge. They are um, central photoportula, so those are a type of opening um, that goes through the valve, and they stand out because. Um, it puts all of them on the side that's elevated, basically, and the other side doesn't have any. Um, and that's the normal pattern for a lot of things that have tangential undulation, is that they um, they basically have this sort of a pattern. So, kind of cool. Um, you're walking your dog. Do you, it may appear in the sky differently. We can see the moon at the same time. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Um, Maybe you like the sound of somebody else's sniffling. Well, I mean, there's probably people that um, don't mind it, but I know I wouldn't like it. So I thought maybe other people probably wouldn't like it. Um, that's just how I am. Uh, I guess because I only think about myself as uh, my context for how things go. I think, well, I really wouldn't like somebody sniffling the whole time when they were trying to talk to me about science. That's repulsive. Um, so I just decided it wasn't that big of a deal. I could miss a stream or two. Nobody's gonna mind. Um, you know, I, I just do it for fun. So if it wasn't gonna be fun, we weren't gonna do it. Um, this is a another diatom right here. It's actually a set of diatoms. Um, this is two halves of a diatom, but um, they don't make a whole diatom when you put them together. They make two halves of sisters siblings. They were attached in a colony together and this is the colony still um, still being connected um, but the rest of the diatom is basically broken off and um, this is Olicocyra. Um, this is the end of one valve and this is the start of the next and these little sort of nubby teeth that you see right here are actually um, the bases of little tiny spines and the spines interfinger with each other like knuckles and they hold themselves together across the interface between the two valves so it's the set of spines on this side that matches the set of spines on this side and um, the the part where they connect to each other so if you want to learn a little bit about Olicocyra that's this, um, this genus um, sorry, Olicocyra is this guy, and um, this is Olicocyra ambigua that we're looking at, that's the species and the genus, and, oh, paleontologizing is reading, oh, thank you, um, how's it going, Danny, welcome in. Uh, you've made my screen explode with a bunch of crazy emotes, Nothing and uh, I love it. Um, how's everybody doing? Um, it's been a while since I did a stream where I was um, on late at night and could have been raided by Danny. Um, so thank you for bringing your viewers in and, and remembering that I exist. Um, uh, it's great to see you here, uh, all of you monstrous uh, number of people that you brought in. Um, I hope your stream went well, and I'm going to just Good take news, a stab everyone. at it and say you were talking about dinosaurs and uh, maybe some really cool, um, news, maybe some really everyone. cool uh, discussions about the ecology of dinosaurs, which um, if you don't know paleontologizing, um, that's what they do. And um, uh, really the only place you can go on Twitch to have somebody talk about dinosaurs with you. So if you grew up, and um, like I did, uh, and like my daughter, uh, and you know the dinosaurs better than the adults that are around you, and you seem fixated on them, um, and you never let go of that fixation, 
Danny's the place where you should go hang out. He's on pretty much every night, um, and he does a variety of really cool things. So I think you should um, definitely give him a look-see or a follow if you're just in here hanging out with me. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know what you mean, pro-tech. Pro-tech? What does that mean? Um, yeah, you, you're busting in on my microscopes. Um, all right. Um, yes, and thank you for giving Danny a shout out. Every weekday, yeah, great. And uh, I was on a stream the other night, and he was talking about um, he's getting some exclusive dinosaur game um, where you you know access to it early, and he's going to share that with his streamers. So if you're also into gaming, he also does a little bit of uh, gaming, especially if it relates to dinosaurs. So um, bear with me a little bit. My throat's still sore. Um, I had a, a cold over the weekend, and I spent all week basically sniffling and coughing. Um, and I'm at the point now where I'm, you know, you, you get over the illness, and then you're, um, you just have some of the symptoms, but you don't really have, like, you're not tired or achy or anything. This is, um, I guess if I were trying to do a radio voice, uh, it would probably be very effective, but I'm not whispering. Uh, this is my normal voice. It's just um, all fried out because of the, uh, the coughing. So, um, but if you'd like me to talk about um, Dusty's Muffin or um, what are some of the other ones that they did on that NPR skits on Saturday Night Live, uh, I can give it a shot. Um, it would be better if I had a panel of people here and we could talk about, you know, recipes with some sort of double entendre. Um, you know, so it would be real. Yeah, sweaty balls, exactly. Sarah knows where I'm coming from. Um, the sweaty balls, the dusty muffin, there's a lot of different uh, recipes that they talk about. Um, <laughs> right, exactly. You're dialed in uh, to 99.3, the diatom. Um, thank you for giving that a shake. Uh, Claire, the, you, something special happened, and you didn't even realize it, which is um, in the, all the colors you can change my little magic bubble that I live in here. Um, you, can't change, you can't change it to purple. Um, the only way to make it turn purple is uh, to shake it and then get lucky uh, because it goes through all of the colors randomly and then it lands on one and it can land on purple and you did it. Uh, you made it turn purple. I can make it turn purple but uh, viewers can only make it turn other colors and then when you shake it it's the only way to make it turn purple. So you've got it back to purple um, which is its magical um, color and nobody can make it. So. Um, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll make, you'll, uh, you'll probably make Claire very angry if you change it, but, um, I can still change it back. All right, we've been looking at just one diatom, uh, for quite a while here, which is Olicocyra ambigua, and I was talking about, um, this sample is from a lake in Wisconsin. This is from Morrow Lake, which is a lake that my wife is currently, um, enumerating. She's doing the analysis on it. She's a diatomist as well. And um, this isn't one of her slides. I, make my, I made my own slide, but I took it from one of her samples, and she doesn't know about it. So, um, <laughs> Oh, um, if you have enough channel points to tell what your diatom spirit guide is, it will pop up and it will tell you. Um, and then it should be attached to you forever. So you are a Solophora. Uh, and um, that's the way you'll be in the channel for all of time. Every time you hit that button, it'll come back to Solophora. And you know what? Let's go find a Solophora, because I saw one in here. Um, we'll just do that in, in Huggins' name. Um, I'm sure there's some in here. Oh, wait, there's one, actually. This is a Solophora. There you go, right in the middle. That is your diatom spirit guide right there. And it's guiding you apparently to push the right set of buttons uh, because there's a lot of them in there that I don't have in this sample but I definitely did have this one. This is the diatom Solophora uh, pupula 
and it's a very common diatom in North America. Slophora pupula is identified by, it has sort of like a, a slight undulating side. Um, it bows out a little bit, and then it kind of comes back in a little bit, and then the ends are really, really subtly capitate. Um, and Slophora often have this sort of a, you see this dark area right here? Um, that is the, um, it's like a little silica platform, a thickening, um, and it creates this very specific uh, dark pattern that we see right there. Um, and that's a common characteristic of Slophora. Um, she's enumerating, it's Marl Lake uh, that she's enumerating. Um, let's go try to find something really uh, different. So there's a lot of diatoms on these slides, of course. Um, and when we count diatom slides, um, normally what we would do, let me zoom all the way out. So everything that you see in the field of view, we would have to enumerate and, um, and track what are we looking at. And the reason that we do that is because diatoms tell us something about the ecosystem. Clara, you're Mastagloia. Very nice. Um, one of my favorite uh, diatom genera, by the way. Um, and if Pacific Plankton is still here, she would tell you that um, the, the name Mastagloia, you won't believe this, um, but it's absolutely true. Um, Mastagloia translates from Latin as nipple glue. I don't know why they called it that, but um, that's, that's what the name means. So, um, but they're very cool diatoms. Uh, not my fault. I didn't name it. I'm just telling you that's what it means and I'm pretty sure that Pacific Plankton will back me up on that Because um, she points out on her stream every time she sees one so um, So we would have to basically look at um, Our sample and then we would have to enumerate um, Everything in it and what I mean by that is we would have to tell what do we see and what species are they? Um, <laughs> You're tempted to find your diatom spirit, but you'd like to remain diatom fluid. Well, you're free to choose or not to choose. Nipple tooth, see? See? Uh, there you go. Uh, that is exactly what I'm talking about. If it starts off masto, you know they were talking about nipples. So, um, there's a lot of weird names in diatom stuff. And I think it's because the German guys that uh, originally did a bunch of the naming of things, I don't think maybe they had some uh, really repressed sexual anxiety or something because um, the little holes that are on diatoms are called areoli. And the split that runs down the middle of the diatom, this thing, is called a raphe. And these are body terms. Um, and they have a process that's called like labiate process. I mean, these guys were really, really like, hey, Mally, you know, Sally. I feel like they, they had some, they had some repressed feelings. So, uh, yeah, exactly. Maybe they weren't breastfed. It's very, very possible. Um, the thing is, uh, in science, the terminology and its origin don't really necessarily have anything to do with what we call it anymore. I mean, people don't walk around calling them the mastodon's nipple teeth, but, uh, you, you just learn what the word is and then uh, and then move forward, right? <laughs> um, it's, you only have so much time. Um, Joshua is a sweet. Thank you for subscribing with Prime. Um, I should point out to people, if this is your first time in the channel, um, I don't always stream from the light microscope. On Wednesdays, I usually stream from a scanning electron microscope. Um, a little less of the bells and whistles happen because it's a little bit more serious when I'm on the scanning electron microscope. Um, at home, my computer can handle a lot more than the computer that my SEM is hooked up to. It's busy running a scanning electron microscope. Um, so there's a little more fun things uh, that go on here. Um, at, and I like to let people just play around with uh, whatever, so I hope you're having fun with it. Um, Boba, hello. Um, Let's see, I should do like a little shout out for Boba. There's one for Boba. Um, Boba Binks is a artist and he um, draws pictures of birds and then he uh, converts them into these sort of templates um, that he creates and carves out and then uses those to paint. Uh, and he paints really sort of intricate and abstract backgrounds and then puts the birds and cats and whatever else on the foreground of them and uh, does it all right on Twitch so you can see it happening, which is pretty cool. 
Um, so for people who also haven't been here uh, before, I also stream photography, uh, birds, the moon, nature stuff basically. Um, sometimes we look at live specimens. Today we're looking at mounted slides. Um, so sometimes we look at living things that are also like, you know, water bears and rotifers and organisms that you'd find in lakes, uh, paramecium and amoeba. Um, so there's a, a wide range of, um, of really cool uh, organisms and I try to, I'm sort of a, a naturalist about things that aren't diatoms um, that I like to stream about. So, um, you know, I, I like to make it, keep it educational and try to keep it fun. So, um, this is a, uh, so I just wanted to give you kind of an example of what I meant. Uh, <laughs> no, that's not a fake all charged battery. That would have been a great uh, gimmick though, Claire. Um, I have a, um, a dummy battery in my camera now and it's plugged in. So my battery will always be on full while I'm streaming. There's no more flashing battery sign. Um, so uh, it'll always just say full because it's plugged in. Um, but I just want to give you an example of what, um, oh wait, I wasn't finished. Um, I, I got a stream for uh, a, um, a subscription from Joshua Sweet a second ago and I wanted to point out that um, I have a I have a job. I'm a professor at a university, and I don't need Twitch to make money. Um, but I do appreciate when people subscribe to my channel. Um, the reason for that is all of the money that comes in um, from bits, cheers, uh, subscriptions. I sell merchandise from the Redbubble uh, store with my own artwork and um, and products that are just on Redbubble. Um, I make calendars with some of the diatom artwork, whatever. I don't take a penny of that home. All hey, of the money that so. comes in goes straight to the lab. And I use it to pay for um, either supplies that we use during the streams or um, to help me pay for student um, research. So if students want to look at something, undergrads that are working in my lab, graduate students that are working in my lab, um, if they need money for something, um, I take it out of that money. and. Um, and so I, I looked at it the other day, I was trying to figure out how much money um, has been brought in to support um, uh, student research in my lab. And just, I started streaming on Twitch maybe uh, a year and a half, almost two years ago, maybe a year and a half or something like that ago. And I've managed to bring in something like um, $1,400 um, in that time. Um, that's gone directly into um, supporting student research in my lab. And I also wanted to point out that right now, um, I have two students that are present. Thank you for the hype train, um, by the way. Um, um, and also, Sam, thanks for um, giving a subscription to Claire. Um, uh, I have students in my lab right now that are presenting at the Geological Society of America meeting from the North um, Central section in Cincinnati and tomorrow they have posters that they're presenting and my wife is also um, driving back and forth between Cincinnati and here it's about a three-hour drive because um, she wanted to be home to, uh, to read bedtime stories to my daughter and um, and so um, she's been down there with my students and I actually have some of my former students um, that are currently um, professors now um, they started off as undergraduates in my lab and they came all the way through my lab as master's students, went on someplace else to get their PhD and now are professors in other universities. And um, I have one of my former students who's there um, that's watching over my, she calls them my little ducklings, um, my little students that are there because I can't be there because um, I'm busy teaching. And, um, and while my wife is um, presenting some of the research from Clear Lake while she's there, um, uh, I'm watching our daughter, so I'm sort of taking care of the house, um, which normally my wife does most of the work for that, um, and I usually am spending most of my time teaching. But um, So they're there taking care of my students, but I have students that are doing presentations tomorrow. Um, so if you're going to go to the GSA meeting in Cincinnati, um, you can check them out. I think part of it is also hybrid, so if you wanted to just attend virtually, I think you can. All right, let's look around a little bit more. Um, and then I wanted to give you also an example of, um, just a really quick example of, um, counting. 
um, because I told you that we had to enumerate stuff, um, I can usually tell something about a sample just by looking at the diatoms and then using something about their ecology to um, figure out what they represent. And um, in any particular field of view is not going to be super informative. In fact, we usually have to count somewhere between 300 and 500 diatoms um, for every slide. We have to identify each one to species. And then um, we look at the transition from one slide to the next slide to the next slide. And we try to tell um, what's happened from one slide to the next with respect to which diatoms are present. And we use this to basically reconstruct things like water chemistry, um, the salinity, the amount of nutrients, the depth, the light level. And if you're thinking that's a lot of things coming from a few species, what I can tell you is that diatoms are extremely sensitive to environmental conditions. And diatom fossils are one of the cornerstones of reconstructing um, paleoclimate for the last um, 4 million, 10 million years. Um, they're one of these tools that we use for relatively young stuff compared to the kind of things that Danny looks at. But, um, but this is how we do it. And one of the things that's really cool about diatoms is because they're so small and because they preserve so well and because they're extremely responsive to the types of environments that they're in, um, you don't have to take very much sample, which means you can have very, very high resolution information coming from that material. Um, it's a small possible fossil, so I'm using a paperclip. It's actually smaller than a paperclip. Um, but just to give you an example um, of, of that model that I was trying to talk about. Um, let's see. Hey, there's a Mastagloia here as well. Um, this thing here, Lindavia um, michiganiana. Um, here's another one, Lindavia michiganiana. This is um, a Pseudostara syra. Brevis striata, this thing right here. Uh, I'm trying to think where they put that thing. Detenta is the species name. I don't remember where they moved the genus. Um, Lindavia um, michiganiana. Lindavia michiganiana, that's a microsphere. That's a particle that we put in the sample so that we can um, figure out the concentration differences. There's another microsphere there. That's Asterionella formosa, but it's just the girdle band, so we normally wouldn't count it. That is the girdle band of this thing. Um, this is uh, Denticula gutzingiana. This thing over here is um, Geisleria um, uh, adaptata. This thing down here is a Amphora pediculus um, or Inariensis. I'm not sure which one. These aren't my samples, um, but there are uh, 9,000 uh, known species of diatoms in North America, and I don't know all of them. so. Um, yeah, why can you see through them? Um, that's a good question, Zorro. The answer to that question is um, these are the skeletons of diatoms, and diatoms are a type of microscopic algae with a opal, opal and silica cell wall. And um, when the organism is alive, chloroplasts would be inside the cell wall, which is where that um, that structure is. And um, and the, um, the fossils that we're looking at just have the opal and silica left. So they're basically little glass, um, you know, valves or, or uh, containers that the cell material used to be in. And we've processed them to get rid of the organic matter that was left as debris in the sample. So all you're seeing is these little glass um, structures that are basically the cell wall or the skeleton of the organism that used to live there. So that's why you can see through them. Um, the other reason you can see through them is, is this. So that's the light source. It shines up from the bottom of the stage, and then it comes into the sample, and then into the lens, and then up through the lens into the headpiece where you're looking at the camera up there. And then there's a split where you can see, um, this is where I can see out of here. And this is a what we call a transmitted light microscope. And um, what that means is the light is transmitted through the sample. And so what you're seeing is basically uh, an x-ray, essentially, of the organism itself. And if you wanted to see what the actual organism looks like, we need a scanning electron microscope to do that. And it happens that I have a scanning electron microscope, but it's not in my house, which is where we are. 
um, it's in my lab uh, back Nothing at school, so uh, at the university. Imagined. Okay, so uh, hopefully that answers that question. Um, we're looking through them. Yes is the answer. Um, it looks a little bit like the floaters you've seen. It's possible. Um, so is this a fossilized microscopic organism? Um, Sarah B. Music, it definitely is. Um, this is a type of algae, and the diatoms that we're looking at on the screen, so this thing here is about 20 microns in length. Um, these ones are about 10 or 15 microns in length. Um, that's about 5 microns. This is a microsphere. They should all be the same size because they were produced by humans. Um, and um, to give you some sense of how big things are, um, there are 1,000 uh, microns in a millimeter, and then, you know, like 1,000 millimeters in a, uh, in a meter. So um, uh, if you're thinking about things in terms of, um, you know, like most people don't work in metric very well, but, um, but the, uh, the general model for that is, you know, like just look at a ruler and the tiniest measurement on there on any modern ruler that has both metric and uh, inches. So the littlest tick mark that you can find on there will be millimeters, and it will take 1,000 uh, microns in order to make up a, um, one of those little ticks. So this tiny little microsphere, which is 5 microns, there would have to be 200 of these in order for you to get 1 millimeter. Um, that's how small these things are. We're looking at them at a thousand times magnification, and then my camera's actually got a little bit of zoom on it. Um, uh, the question that Danny asked is, are most diatoms genera monospecific, like dinosaurs? And the answer is no. Um, very few of them are actually uh, monotypic. Um, the, uh, the majority of them have more than one, um, more than one species. So some of them only have a few. Um, but the ones in North America that I was talking about usually have hundreds um, of species. An interesting fact, um, I actually told my Lakes and Wetlands class today, we were talking a little bit about vertebrates. And, um, you know, like I threw out this number, 9,000 diatom species. And if you're not used to thinking about the numbers of species of things, that probably doesn't sound very impressive to you. But um, the most abundant species of vertebrates, which is going to give you something that you're used to thinking about on planet Earth, are uh, fish. There are approximately 24,000 species of fish on planet Earth, and if you took all of the rest of the vertebrates on planet Earth and you put them into one bin that was vertebrate but not fish, there would still be more fish species than there are vertebrates. Um, so there are more fish species on planet Earth at 24,000 than there are every other vertebrate combined. Um, so just to give you some sense of things that you're thinking about, you know, like every animal that you see with the skeleton, um, there's more fish. And part of the reason for that is that most of the vertebrates are um, derived from fish. Fish are tetrapods. Most of the things that we think of as vertebrates, I think, are tetrapods. Um, but... Uh, but just to give you some concept of that, in North America, in the in just in, in North America, there are more than nine thousand diatom species, and on planet Earth, uh, known species of diatoms are there's more of those than there are of fish. So there are more diatom species than there are all vertebrate species that you've ever heard of, um, you know, in in uh, on planet Earth. <laughs> Does that count tetrapods as fish in the tele? No. I mean, yes. Tetrapods, fish are tetrapods. Yeah, right. Um, now I'm not saying all tetrapods are fish. I'm saying all fish are tetrapods. Um, so just to give you some concept, right? So there's a, there's a fairly large number of diatoms um, on in, in North America. Um, one of the things I am always been impressed with when I go to Danny's streams and um, he's talking and he shows um, all these dinosaurs. Hang on a second. Uh, this is for Claire if you're still here. That's a Mastigloia. It's just a fragment of one. Um, I think that's Mastigloia grevellii, but I'm not positive about the ID. Um, uh, 
one of the things I was always impressed with when I go to Dana's channel is that he throws up a picture of a dinosaur and he knows all of them. I mean, he just knows all the dinosaurs. There's only like, I don't know, like 400 species of dinosaurs though. I mean, the, there's not that many of them compared to diatoms. So if you showed me 400 diatom species, I definitely could nail at least 400 of them. Um, so, I mean, not to make it any less impressive because that's way more diverse than uh, that's just, you know, diatoms are kind of uh, small and, and we have to learn a lot of them. Um, but I, I'm always impressed by that. I always thought, wow, he just he knows all of them. You just like point him any dinosaur, he immediately knows what it is. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, anyway, uh, let's look around a little bit more in this slide and I'm going to see if I can find anything that's, um, there's some really pretty diatoms in here. Um, Here's a really big one. Let's stop and take a look at this. this is a Simbella. Um, oh, you have 2,000. Well, I mean, I don't know how things get split. So, um, yeah. Well, a quarter of those are probably not valid. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything about the validity. I just, I went looking for how many diatom species are there, or dinosaur species are there, and I was like, oh, it's only like 400. Um, I always thought maybe there was more. But, I mean, if you know that many, it's still pretty impressive. Uh, here we go. This is um, a Cymbella. That's the genus. That's, um, hang on a second. We can take any diatom genus from a freshwater diatom. And I can type this little thing, and then a window pops up, and it actually takes you to the um, web page for the guide from diatoms of North America. Um, uh, is right there. Uh, your guide species will only show up for a couple of seconds, and then um, it's the same diatom guide species for you always, so you, you don't have to worry about that. Um, you're working on a publication very early stage about dinosaur tax account. Oh. Um, so, diatom uh, um, speciation, um, if you're wondering like how many are on planet Earth, the answer is that we don't know. Um, if you take all of the fossil species and all of the modern species, I think there's something like 40,000 described species, but there's hundred or more than hundreds of species that are described every year um, for diatoms. So those numbers are rapidly changing. And I'm responsible for some of that. I've described a new genus and several new species, and I have a paper right now that's um, close to being accepted. I just need to make some revisions where we describe five new species of diatoms. Um, just to give you like a sense of it, right? And um, the expectation is that our, our estimates of species are off by quite a bit. Um, most taxonomists think that the number of diatom species on planet Earth, when the ultimate tally is put together, will be somewhere in the neighborhood of between one and two million species of diatoms. And I don't know how valid that is. It's a number that if you go to the Diatoms of North America webpage, that's the one that they actually cite. And so I suspect that those guys aren't messing around. Those are mostly taxonomists that put the page together. And I think those estimates are probably pretty close. Um, so the, I, you know, that's a lot of species. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I can attest to this by saying that, like, no matter where I go, if I take a sample and I start poking around in it, I find stuff that I cannot identify and it's not because I don't have the skills to identify them or the books to identify them it's that they probably don't have names and in my library of slides in my lab I just I mean I have dozens of things which I just have marked as sp1 sp2 sp3 they're too uncommon for me to bother to even put a name on them um, you know I'd need to have a pretty large population of them to do a good job describing them um, but a lot of it's just outside of the realm of what I have time to do. So, um, so anyway, this is a, a nice uh, example of a um, of a Simbella. And if you're wondering, like, where did it get its name? I feel like you should be able to guess. Um, we all know what a symbol is, right? Like the kind of thing that the uh, drummer plays in the band, right? The tap 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 with the cymbals, or like bang together in a marching band um, and this has the shape of a symbol so it actually has a name similar to the thing that we would think of um, 
uh, Alt Miss Frizzle. Hello, Alt Miss Frizzle. Um, and also, thank you for joining in relatively early and being so excited about Diatoms, Miss Frizzle. Um, I saw you here really early and seemed pretty excited when I said we were going to be looking at diatoms um, from mounted slides today. Um, your question is, do you think asexual reproduction contributes to or reduces diatom speciation? Um, don't some of them reproduce sexually? The answer to that question is, asexual reproduction does not contribute in any way to diatom speciation. It cannot. Uh, and the reason for that is because diatoms that are reproducing asexually are clones. And by definition, clones don't have genetic variability. They are, if they're made perfectly, exactly the same as the thing that sprung them. So, um, so they don't have any, uh, they don't have any, um, any way of generating any kind of speciation. However, I want to, um, to point out that, so your second part of your question is, don't some of them reproduce sexually? And the answer is, all of them reproduce sexually. It's just that diatoms undergo a two-staged sexual cycle. Most of the time, they are reproducing asexually. So they just clone themselves, and they just keep cloning themselves and cloning themselves. And the way that they do that is something that we usually just call binary fission. In other words, we have one organism, and it grows uh, two halves of itself inside of the existing skeleton, inside the cell wall. Um, one half goes with this side of the, the valve, and the other side grows another half that closes itself off. And then we have two organisms that are just kind of attached to each other, that are used to be one, and now there's two, and then they just split apart. Um, and so you end up with an organism that is just cloned itself by basically splitting in half and forming two new organisms where there used to be one. And so this is a kind of confusing concept for people, unless you're used to like thinking about an amoeba, right? Amoeba do the same thing. They just keep constantly splitting themselves. And so an amoeba is effectively an infinite organism. And diatoms in many ways are kind of infinite organisms because they just, where there was one, there's two, and there's no way to tell which one was the adult because now you just have two daughters and those two daughters make two daughters, and those two daughters make two daughters. Um, but when they split enough, um, because they're creating the valve inside of uh, an existing valve, it causes one of the valves, one of the, um, the daughters will be slightly smaller because they had to make a valve that fit inside of a small valve, right? And, um, and then when this one splits, it needs to make a valve that fits inside of that one uh, when it splits off. And when that half then becomes apparent, it has to create one that fits inside of that one. And so the population gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And they reach some point where um, it triggers them to switch to sexual reproduction. And there's a huge value to this because cloning yourself is the best way to take over an environment you can very rapidly replicate and you can basically colonize anything you want, um, which is why diatoms are partially, part, part of the reason why diatoms are such sensitive ecological indicators, because if they're doing well, they just replicate like crazy, asexually, just cloning themselves. They're in their perfect environment. They'll just keep making as many of themselves as they can. And then when they get a little bit smaller, what happens is, they switch to sexual reproduction um, because they get too small, right? They get to the point where they're basically unable to keep making smaller and smaller valves, and it triggers them to go to sexual reproduction. And usually there has to be an additional environmental cue um, that is telling them that they're under optimal conditions. And then what happens is some of the diatoms will basically split apart, and, um, and then when they split apart, gametes will come out of some of them. They'll, they'll turn into boys, if you like. Uh, and some of them will just become eggs that will get fertilized. And so that's the way that, um, for the most part, that's the way that the centric diatoms, or the, the ones that are radially symmetric, that's how they behave. And they are the ones that are usually plankton, and they're living in the water column, and they're reproducing like crazy. A typical diatom, if you gave it all of the nutrients that it could possibly need, can replicate under the ideal conditions and temperatures maybe eight times in one night. 
So that's not one diatom splitting eight times. The first one splits. Each one of those splits. So now we have two that each split into four, which each split into four, right? Which split, so you, you can do the math. Um, that turns one organism into like 128 organisms overnight. And um, they can just keep doing that under ideal conditions. And then they could switch to sexual reproduction whenever they need to. So the speciation of, of diatoms happens during sexual reproduction because that's the only time you have genetic exchange from one species, uh, from one specimen to another specimen. The rest of the time is cloning, and there's no, um, there's no way to have speciation occur when you're cloning yourself. At best, you might mutate yourself um, if something goes horribly wrong and you can't copy your genetic information correctly. Um, but for the most part, um, as I was talking about one evening um, with Evo Lazi, um, typically what happens when you, you get mutation, like point mutations or something, um, diatoms have photo repair mechanisms. They try to repair their DNA, and most algae do as well. And a lot of the smaller organisms or organisms that are exposed to UV light actually have photo repair mechanisms in place that basically say, my DNA is damaged, I need to fix my DNA. And, um, and they'll try to repair the damage that's been done by light energy. And so um, it's very, very difficult. The, the cloning process produces very stable, consistent offspring, or um, they get damaged so badly that basically they can no longer survive. So it usually is a counterproductive thing to get point mutations for most diatom species, I would, I would guess, um, and any kind of algae. But um, when they, you know, they turn into the sexual reproduction, then you get genetic exchange, and then you can actually get some speciation that occurs. I want to follow that comment up, because this is actually a really interesting conversation. Um, I look at diatoms through time, and I'm a paleontologist, um, as, as much as Danny um, would, would, would tell you. Um, I look at evolution in diatoms, and I specialize in looking at diatoms through very long periods of time. I, I come at diatom um, uh, paleoecology from the side of a geologist. I'm a, I'm a geologist by training, um, which is why I am always in Danny's channel making snarky comments about paleontology because I'm a paleontologist and I know all the things that I need to know to be a paleontologist. But I function in a realm of ecologists and biologists most of the time. And they're used to thinking on very small time scales. And I'm used to thinking in these very long time scales because I'm trained as a geologist. And so I'm looking at samples that go through and span through millions of years. And um, and uh, I look at some samples and I can actually detect evolution in diatoms from the top of a core to the bottom of a core or from the bottom of a core to the top of a core as we would say as geologists um, we start at the bottom in time and move towards the present but I've observed and documented evolution in a number of species in the span of thousands of years and you can one of the things is diatoms are very very capable during those sexual reproduction events of exchanging a lot of, uh, of DNA, and um, and they appear to be one of these organisms that can very rapidly um, evolve. And there's many examples, not just the ones that I have um, documented, but um, but uh, the, my advisor and some of the, her colleagues, um, they have examples of this from Yellowstone Lake, where they had one species, and basically they can just watch it grow into two different species um, in in the lake system itself. Um, you can actually see it evolve if you look through the sediments pretty quickly in spans of typically somewhere between um, two and four or two and five thousand years, somewhere in that range. We can definitely see diatoms evolving. And um, if you ask most of the, the taxonomists about how long most of the genera, the diatom genera that we observe, how old are they? I think most of them will tell you that the diatom genera that we observe, there's um, more than 200 genera of diatoms in the freshwater realm. I don't know how many are in the marine realm because I don't study marine diatoms. But I think they will tell you that um, most of those things are young, uh, very young genera. Um, there, there's a bunch of very old ones that are still around. 
but, um, but most of the genera that we've observed have speciated, and they actually suggest that in some cases that it may be human beings that are leading to their speciation, um, that we are moving them around because we move around, and we keep introducing them into environments that they may not have been in before, and they are rapidly colonizing these places and basically evolving into those spaces, and that the, many of the genera that we see appear to be fairly short-lived. I mean, in terms of how long how long they've been around. They're young. Um, uh, and even though diatoms have been around since the age of the dinosaurs, um, there's fairly good evidence that, that there were long lineages of pretty stable genera. And then more recently, we've seen them just radiating like crazy. Um, and people, you know, people have made an argument that it's human beings that are sort of creating that um, environment for them. Okay, um, so let's see. I found out this rock was a shell nodule after breaking off a bit with your trusty pig Brooklyn. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Uh, thank you for explaining this. I've never had anyone give a thorough explanation. They just say they reprodu reproduce viruses um, by binary fission. Um, I, I can actually provide you with some pretty good reference material for um, for what to, I think are you a teacher or something, um, but I can give you some examples um, in and. In, there's some pretty good pictures that we often use to sort of showcase that um, that behavior. So they don't teach you about this when you specialize in ruminant nutrition. Um, well, you know, you can always learn, um, and I'm I'm glad uh, that there's people here who are interested in this sort of stuff. Uh, I've got a lot of you know knowledge just sitting around in my head that uh, I tell my students, and you know the ones that are in my lab are excited, but the rest of them don't care. So. Um, especially with those sudden switches to sexual reproduction, diatoms might really typify punctuated equilibrium. So, um, you know, the idea of punctuated, punctuated equilibrium um, always came across to me, Danny, as just a measure of scale. Um, if you look at things closely enough, evolution always happens fairly quickly. Um, and if you, um, if you, especially on geologic time scales, right? So if we're looking at just a few thousand years and they're evolving very rapidly um, I think that that it's it's sort of a matter of scale um, if you you know if you if you're taking a long view um, and I think also the geologic record is biased towards creating a view of um, of punctuated equilibrium because we don't have all of the data it's like a puzzle piece it's like a puzzle with some of the pieces missing and so it looks like there's this big jump that happens all of a sudden um, quite frequently. Um, so yeah, you're a ninth grade biology teacher. Yeah, oh, great. Um, I, I usually like to try to keep my um, my streams in the family friendly uh, category. So I, I try to keep people from uh, saying things that would be um, challenging in case people want to use any of my um, uh, VODs or whatever as teaching material. And I archive almost everything that I re when I remember to do it on my YouTube channel, which I never tell anybody about. But there's a YouTube channel out there. If you just Google Diatoms Attack and all the SEM stuff and most of the light microscope stuff and all the birding and whatever else that I whenever I remember to do it, um, get archived on there. Um, so feel free to share any of that with your classes. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy. I'm here trying to educate people. So I'm happy if people can use it for those purposes. All right. So let's look around a little bit more. Um, I've been staring at that one diatom for a very long time and um, it's a little bit easier to do when there's moving things on the screen but it's hard to talk and, and run a microscope and sometimes at the same time. This is a stephanodiscus, um, a very large stephanodiscus and just to give you some idea of um, how we can use them for environmental information, um, this very large stephanodiscus usually indicates elevated nutrient conditions um, so if I saw a lot of these, it would suggest to us that um, the environment is becoming more uh, nutrient enriched, usually from people that are um, putting some extra nutrients in the environment, but not always. Um, this thing that's back here, um, as I mentioned before, is Lindavia michiganiana. This guy right here um, has a transverse undulation on the valve face. It's a little smaller in terms of its um, actual size, um, usually indicates stratified lake conditions and this thing back here uh, is fragment uh, a bit of a dissolved version of lindavia intermedia 
And um, these things, you're wondering to yourself, well, if this is a, a lake that's well mixed and has lots of nutrients, and this is a stratified lake, which usually has low nutrients, and this one is um, sort of an indication of deep lake mixing, um, or slightly stratified conditions, if you want to think of it the other way, how are they in the sample together? Um, a couple of things. Our samples represent in time. Um, this sample probably actually spans um, something like 15 years. So um, what happens in lake systems is in the spring a lake will mix and when it mixes basically there's a lot of nutrients available in the water column and this thing will bloom and um, as we move into the late spring and early summer the lake will start to stratify a little bit and then this thing will bloom and then when you move into the late summer condition the lake becomes very strongly stratified and then this thing will bloom and in our sample, we actually have all three of them together. These are the dominant uh, centric diatoms in these samples because they're representing the different seasons. But if I see a bunch more of these, I know that the lake's season may have extended. So we have more spring mixing or we have more summer stratification or a longer um, sort of late spring uh, extension. And so we can look at these to tell us something about how the environment changes through time by looking at the concentration of this one versus this one versus this one in the water column. Um, this process of, uh, of having organisms that would normally be competing for resources that are living in the same lake system, and we know that because they're collected from the same sediments, um, that, that would normally be fighting for resources but they've divided the seasons up. This one does well in the spring, this one does well late spring, early summer, this one does better in the summer. This is a process that ecologists call a nutrient or, or um, a partitioning, a niche partitioning in, in environment. And um, it's a way for many organisms to, um, to live in the same ecosystem but not have to fight for resources and um, so this niche partitioning approach is um, it's used by lots of organisms. It's used by algae especially, uh, and the diatoms will use this as a, as a way so that this one and this one don't have to fight with each other for the resources that they need. They have different um, nutrient preferences. This one likes high nutrient, this one likes low nutrient, and this likes something in between. And they have different silica um, and uh, phosphorus and nitrogen preferences. And they use that to basically occupy that same deep water lake environment where they live, um, but they can occupy it in different times of the year. And so this is actually a really cool strategy. It's used by many organisms. It's used by um, oop, noot, noot, um, by warblers. So if you're a birder, I'm a birder. Um, I know that some of you are birders, but you're only interested in those really old birds. Um, you know. Jurassic birds, uh, but if you're a birder and um, and you know anything about warblers, you know that warblers will also do a similar strategy. One will live in the bottom parts of the same types of pine trees. Some of them will, or they'll hunt for food in the bottom parts of pine trees. And uh, another species basically will just occupy the top parts of the pine trees um, so that they don't have to compete with each other for those same resources. They just scavenge the part that they are most capable of getting to easily. So yeah, niche par partitioning is a pretty awesome uh, concept. You're starting to find this with dinosaurs, and I would imagine that you um, that all organisms have this as a tactic, as a as a way for um, for for them to basically access the same resources and not have to compete for those resources because um, interspecies competition is probably the most damaging for them. And so if they can find a way to avoid that, I mean, being eaten is also problematic, but you can overcome that by just producing a lot of offspring or, or trying to make defensive structures for yourself. But if the resources become scarce, that basically destroys your whole population. Um, so that's a, a critical concern. Um, I also spotted something while I was blabbing, and that is, um, I usually I'm just looking at diatoms, um, but 
that is not a diatom. This is a diatom, diatom. These are all diatoms. This is a uh, Pseudostarosaurus brevistrata. That's uh, Stephanodiscus nigeri. This is Lindavia. Um, Michiganian, as I mentioned, those are microspheres. And um, this thing is not a diatom. It's an imposter, um, but it's closely related. This is a chrysophyte scale. And chrysophytes um, are a type of golden brown algae, so they're cousins to the diatoms. And um, they create these sort of scaled body structures. And um, during the active part of their life stage, they have scales on the outside of their cell walls. And when they go inactive, they create something called a stomatocyst, which has also got a silica um, component to it. And um, I can probably find you a chrysophyte stomatocyst because they're often also captured in the same diatom samples that we look at. So we have to be pretty much aware of what all of the little particles that we come across are instead of just diatoms. So not everything that you see is a diatom, although most of it is um, in these samples. Um, but there are things that are closely related that are in them. Um, so this chrysophytes um, stomatocysts are one. Um, another that we could possibly encounter in our sample is a phytolith, and um, that is a piece of plant that basically just incidentally usually puts a little bit of silica in the cell spaces or within the cells of the plants. And so the shape of a phytolith mimics um, a cell wall of a plant cell. And those can be somewhat symmetrical, and so they might confuse you into thinking that they're something like a diatom. It's a nice, dense, dense view of, um, of some diatoms right there for you. Almost everything in the field of view there is a diatom, except for a little bit of dirt and some microspheres. Um, but hang on, I wanted to just show this while I'm here, and we're talking about it. <laughs> newt, newt! Uh, thank you for the newts. Uh, this little guy right here is a chrysophyte stomatocyst. They look like little Christmas tree ornaments when you look at them in the scanning electron microscope. In the light microscope, let's just zoom in like crazy people. Hey, Crowl and Fang, thank you um, for the cheer. Um, oops, I got a little too close and lost track of it. There it is. Okay. Um, it was being covered by uh, shamrocks or something. Um, so this... Uh, little opening you can just barely see we're zoomed in like crazy on the light microscope but that's what this thing right here is this is a chrysophyte stomatocyst and it probably doesn't belong to the one that had that uh, scale that we saw there's a lot of different um, species of chrysophytes but um, because the scaled organism is the one that people know and put a name on and this is a um, it's sort of like they go in through a hibernation period um, this is their hibernating form um, and they create a totally different skeletal structure to hide inside of these things and live through the winter usually. Um, people don't know what stomatosis necessarily goes with the organism. This is a common problem in paleontology. Um, if you're an organism that makes tracks, uh, sometimes we can figure out what the organism is that's made the tracks, but you know, you don't always know what that organism is and sometimes it's a challenge and um, so there's a whole field called um, ichnophases, ichnofossils, where they're basically looking at trace fossils which are like footprints of dinosaurs, footprints of anything. Snails leave a trail when they move around in sediments. Um, it doesn't matter what it is, if it leads a trail or it, it burrows for example, um, those things basically they leave a mark and we find those things as fossils but they're not really organisms they're things that make those shapes and trying to connect those pieces is challenging um, in in um, in ichnofossils in the in the study of trace fossils they just give names to the things as though they're species because they see the shape and they know the shape you know paleocaster is this uh, you know organism that created these spiral burrows and we found the spiral burrows for a long time and we never figured out what the organism was and eventually they found it was some sort of rodent I think um, that was creating these uh, spiral burrows uh, in in what they think were probably prairie like settings um, and um, so these are just a trace we'd find the trace but we didn't know what the organism was and this is similar to that um, it's the 
the resting stage for the organism, but we don't know what the actual stage of the organism that goes with the resting stage is. And in chrysophytes, I don't study chrysophytes, but um, in chrysophytes, they just put numbers on these things, which I find hilarious. The first time I heard that, I was like, what? They have a whole book and they're just like, this one's number two, this one's number three. Like just somebody went through and put a number on each one. And I guess when they find new ones, they just give them new numbers. Um, to me, that's a crazy, crazy way to handle this situation because remembering, oh, that's number 317, of course. That's harder, in my honest opinion, than learning some crazy Latin name. I mean, we don't usually think of it that way, but, um, but putting a crazy Latin name on something actually helps you remember it a lot better than that's number 217 or whatever. Um, I, I think those are kind of crazy. All right, so I'm going to come back and try to catch this comment. Um, Happy Nightmare says, I'm distracted with my homework um, from my dinosaur course, but every time I look up or listen, it's like, whoa, amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, are crisis fights <laughs> earlier branching than diatoms? Um, I don't know. The chrysophytes, um, I'll help you with that. It's chrysophyte. I actually don't know the, um, the, the how old they are. Um, they probably, they're all... Um, Stromenophiles, stromenophiles. So uh, I think they're probably just um, sisters in terms of time, but I don't know exactly for sure. And I, I because I don't study them, um, I just find them. And I actually don't look at the really old stuff um, in diatom worlds. Stromenophiles, yeah, like stromens. Yeah, they have some hairs that uh, three hairs that basically um, diatoms have evolved away from. They're they're a um, ancestral feature that they um, that they lost, a lost character. But um, the whole group of them have these like little hairs that, uh, sets of hairs that come off of them. And I think the Chrysophytes still have the hairs, um, but diatoms don't. So um, uh, there's some really cool diatoms right, right around the corner though. This is uh, again for Claire, there's a Mastogloia. Somebody told me they had a Navicula as their uh, spirit guides. There's some Naviculas in this as well. There's another uh, a Slopher right there in the middle. Um, and then there's a ton of stuff in here. It's, um, it's all, I did a pretty crappy job of making this slide because there's a bunch of junk stacked on top of each other. Um, this would make a bad slide to try to count because um, this is too dense right here. So you'd get to this and just be like, I can't handle all of the diatoms. Um, I'm actually might be able to count it, but it's hard to track um, which things you've counted and which things you haven't counted when it's just in your head. <laughs> Stromenophile, yeah, no. Um, uh, okay, what did I miss? Something else. Hey, Chippy Flip, how's it going? Um, sorry, I should give you a shout out. I'm, uh, I'm in uh, blabbing mode, I guess. Uh, just trying to keep up with all of the cool questions people have been asking me, and at the same time, uh, trying to occasionally at least juggle over to the microscope and, um, and take a look at some things. So um, there's a ton of, of diatoms here in their field of view. Um, I probably could name most of them, uh, but there's some in there that I just, I don't know what they are uh, because this isn't my sample, it's my wife's. Um, and she probably could name all of them though. If we brought her down and stuck her on the stream, um, this one, for example, that's Anumastus rostratus. Uh, that's an amphora. Um, it looks like uh, Labica, maybe. Um, there's another Slophora pupula um, in the field of view. This thing over here is Navicula um, oblonga. There's some more Chrysophyte stomatosis for you. That's Oligocyra ambigua. Um, I don't know. This is a girdle view of a diatom, so I can't tell what it is, but that. There is the uh, Salafra pupula. Um, this is like a diatom rave. Yeah, there's a lot going on um, in the sample. And actually, I was just I was just trying to like look around in the sample, and then Danny brought in this huge crowd of people, and there's been a, a kind of nonstop set of questions coming my way, and I'm trying to fend them off as best as I can. Um, but I think maybe we could switch to looking at some other material. Because um, I have a whole bunch of slides here, and I just wanted to 
Um, I'd like to send them all off. I'm going to send these to um, our friends over at Science Streams. I know that Danny often raids them because they. Um, I see you people in Science's channel, and I sometimes see Science's people um, in Danny's channel. Um, and I am sending and have sent uh, uh, Belint some uh, diatom slides, and I wanted to send him a few more. Um, so because uh, he said that they'd look through them and that there was a lot of people that were interested in looking at the diatom samples. Um, so I thought, oh, well, you know, I can send him some more. This is easy to do, and it's for education, so I'm always going to do something if it's for education, um, and reaches out to his audience and gives them something a little bit more interesting or different to look at than they usually do. Oops, bumped the stage. All right, this is a sample from, um, I'm just gonna pull this up. Hopefully there's some stuff on it. Um, we're a little close, uh, but this is a marine sample. Um, and I brought this out in part um, because I know that Danny's famously from San Francisco area or the yeah, San Francisco area, um, someplace over there. And um, this is actually some material that our, um, our friend Pacific Plankton sent me. So, and Pacific was here early. She's one of my moderators and I'm her moderator. Um, so I just wanted to give her a little shout out. Um, but this is some material that she sent me and that I'm gonna make some slides and send them off to, to, um, to Danny. Uh, question, if you had to defend the honor of diatoms against some foraminifera fans, uh, re what reason would you give them to prove that diatoms are cooler than forams? I'm just going to start with, uh, yeah, you live, you live in San Francisco Bay. This is basically taken from your backyard. Um, she collects plankton out there um, off of the Torpedo Wharf, uh, right by the um, right by the, uh, the bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and sometimes she does little live streams from there. And uh, she sent me this material. I processed it, and then I made some slides. And I sent them back to her, and um, she shared them with some people. And I thought I could also send some of this stuff on as well to uh, Belint to let them look at some, some marine diatoms. I don't know these ones to um, species. I know them to genus. But they taste like Smarties, right? That's all that matters. Um, that's one thing you could say. I don't, I don't know if they're going to take that as an argument um, if you tell them, well, diatoms smell or taste like Smarties. And Good news, I mean, everyone. What, what exactly is a foram? It's um, a snot with a shell. It's basically just an amoeba, you know, like derivative an amoeba with a shell. Um, but if they want to have a contest about it, you can throw this at them. There are 50, I think that's the right answer, all time, 50 species of forams, 50 species. I mean, I have more than 50 species in this slide right here and they have like 50 total and that's like all time. I mean that's that's terrible in terms of species diversity and if I was going to have a throwdown with somebody I'd be like, oh I learned 50 species, that's the entire group of all forams that there are. Not genera, 50 species, look it up. I looked at that once and I was like, what? There's 50 species? That's it? I mean, 50? That's a tiny number. And, you know, to, they make such a big deal out of the 50. I mean, everybody could learn 50 species. That's so easy. I could learn forums in like an afternoon. I've learned 50 diatoms in one day. Um, okay, how's that? Does that work? I feel like that's a good throwdown. You could use that, right? I think it's true too. I think I'm, I think that's true. I would Google it first and make sure, but I think that's true. Uh, it's definitely way less than, um, you know, forty thousand or one million or two million. Um, there's just not that many of them. So uh, I don't know who you're trying to start a fight with, but um, if you want to lob an apple of discord uh, into the group, just throw that at them. And, uh, and say, you know, come back to me when you get a real group of organisms, not just like, you know, some tiny little collection of stuff you're making a big deal about. Um, that's obviously just in joke. Uh, I love the foraminifera people, and 
I don't want to start a fight with them, but if they want to start stuff, it's on. Um, you know, I'll do it. Uh, okay, let's zoom in and look at these crazy pores. Um, <laughs> biology battle. Let's have a throwdown. Um, you know, sure. This is a... Uh, um, these little polygonal things that you're seeing are actually the... Um, this is the frustral of one marine diatom, and these are the uh, the areoli, the openings um, on the actual valve, um, on the valve face. Um, the tiny openings are actually these things right here, and then these cells are what we call uh, loculate, which means they have an opening at the top, and then a chamber, and this is the chamber, these honeycomb shapes, and then on the inside they have a covering as well with a little opening, and so um, there's a, uh, a two-staged, it's like basically a little honeycomb uh, opening uh, on the outside, a honeycomb wall, and then a second layer of silica on the inside of these things. And, um, and then all these little details we can see so nicely in the scanning electron microscope, we can get just a hint of what they look like in the light microscope. Um, but if I zoom out really far, you'll see, oh, it's a round thing. We're looking at a round thing up close. So, um, this is uh, Cosinodiscus, I believe. Um, again, these aren't my, uh, this isn't my group. I look at freshwater diatoms, but I occasionally like to um, dig around and look at the um, marine stuff just because it's huge relative to the freshwater stuff. They're very large because oceans have much more wave energy um, than lakes typically, and it can support larger organisms that are heavier. And so um, a lot of the marine diatoms that are plankton are much, much bigger than the, the freshwater plankton. So um, when we zoom in, uh, you start looking at really small structures um, rather than what we were looking at um, and seeing a lot of really cool detail um, on the valve face um, because everything is big in the marine world. It's like the, it's like the Texas of, uh, of diatoms where everything is bigger, right? Um, uh, for diatoms, that there are some little ones in here. That is a sneaky little freshwater diatom. Uh, right, barely visible right there. That's about the size of that little Michiganiana that we were looking at in the last sample. Um, just to give you some context. Um, one of the things that's kind of neat is that all diatoms are single-celled organisms. And um, that's one species from the freshwater realm, and that is just one organism uh, where you could probably fit 40 of those things onto the surface of that. Um, in terms of size. Um, for the plankton, that is almost always true, and often for the benthic species as well, the marine ones are just bigger. Um, most of my marine diatomist colleagues, they don't look at stuff at 100x, they just look at it, I mean, with a thousand times magnification, they usually just look at stuff at like 40, they don't need 400, um, they don't usually need to switch over to the 1000, you know, 1000 times, so 400 uh, magnification is usually fine for them. Um, to get things even to species. They almost never use um, immersion oil or, or have to take it up to the, um, the really fine detailed size because everything is huge. Um, this is actually an argument I often make with people which is that um, if you learn the freshwater diatoms and then um, you find that um, there's a marine diatom in your sample, you know right away that thing is an alien that does not belong in your landscape. And so um, if you were to observe it, um, you would see it. Hey, user plus number, thank you. Um, if you would observe it, you would be like, oh, oh, this isn't a freshwater diatom at all. Um, you can usually tell right away that there is something in there that doesn't belong in there. And, um, and that's, an, that's a nice feature. I usually tell people, like, you could you could train a high school student to recognize the difference between most marine genera and uh, and most freshwater genera. Um, one thing is just they have really big differences in the sizes. Um, there's characteristics that are different, and there are some some genera that um, transect or transgress um, both marine and freshwater systems. So not all of the genera are exclusively one or the other. Um, another thing that's kind of cool is we're seeing a little bit of um, let me see if I can, how can I zoom out? I don't know if I can get any farther away without changing my objectives. 
but um, you see that sort of blue color right there? Um, it's a bit of interference that's being created by the polarizer. Um, this is a, a differential interference contrast um, uh, optics on this uh, microscope, which is why the microscope is so expensive. It's actually not the frame or the name or anything else. It's actually this feature. We're using differential interference contrast, which is um, makes all the objectives more expensive. Um, but you see this sort of bluish color, and then there's sort of like a red color out here. Those aren't real. Um, diatoms are translucent, or transparent even. Um, they don't have color, uh, especially when the chloroplasts have been dissolved out. Um, uh, but um, this is what we call physical color. Uh, in other words, the light is refracting through the skeleton of the diatom, and its um, refraction is basically creating colors. And um, Somebody just used, Oak Organic just used a freckled science emote. This is actually one of the things that freckled science is studying, I think, for her PhD, is um, uh, physical color. I think she's looking at other things than diatoms, but um, diatoms are one of the things that they, um, they've identified that have physical color. Uh, we know that they're not actually these colors. They're just, it's opal, right? It's clear. So... Um, uh, you trust that same high school schooler, high schooler to code your phylogeny? No, um, I probably wouldn't. But um, but you could pretty quickly learn the differences between um, things that you can see in the marine realm. Even the small ones look really different. Um, like this little guy here, he looks pretty different from most of the diatoms that we saw. They have these little hexagonal uh, structures and those loculate um, valve faces with the cells that have these like weird hexagons on the surface. Um, that doesn't happen in freshwater diatoms. Um, there's not a single f true freshwater diatom that's not just like a partial um, genus from the marine realm that's snuck over that has that loculate-like structure on the valve face. So this sort of weird grid, that's a marine feature that's just not something we see in freshwater systems. Um, this guy that we're looking at here is actually uh, triangular-shaped. Um, we, were, we were talking about this the other day on Danny's stream, and I was chiming in about how diatoms... Um, he was talking about uh, an observation is actually something I'd never thought about before, um, that organisms usually either have bilateral symmetry, like, you know, human beings, tetrapods, everything else, um, or they have radial symmetry. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Diatoms have both. Um, this is an example of a centric diatom. It has radial symmetry. In other words, um, it has a central point, and you could then um, you have this radiation, this direction in three directions in this case. And the diatom has symmetry that has a mirror plane. You could run along the length of it in one, two, three directions. If it's only two directions, um, this also does have bilateral symmetry, by the way, which means that you could fold it along this axis if it went all the way through. Um, but there's three of those. Um, and in true bilateral symmetry, you'd only be able to do that once. Like, it can only fold me one way and get a perfect mirror of myself. Um, in an ideal world, we'd be perfect. But, you know, human faces are not perfect. Um, our heads are not perfect. Um, uh, but... Um, but this, this is what we usually would refer to as radial symmetry because true bilateral symmetry, you wouldn't be able to do it three times. You'd only be able to do it once. Um, but this is an example of a, a centric diatom, a diatom that has radial symmetry. And all of the round diatoms that we've been looking at, um, everything that we looked at that was round uh, circular diatoms today, um, in all of the other stuff, in, including this sample, those all have uh, radial symmetry. Anything round has radial symmetry. Um, but uh, so there's an example. These all have radial symmetry, right? So there's, you could fold this thing like um, an infinite number of different directions and get um, the same shapes. These ones also have radial symmetry. Um, but if I look around a little bit, I'll show you one that has uh, bilateral symmetry. I just have to find one. We're looking at some plankton samples, and the plankton usually are dominated by things with radial symmetry. So here's a uh, Ellerbeckia, for example, that's radial symmetry. Um, this thing uh, does not. That does not have radial symmetry. It's shaped very asymmetrically. But um, if we were looking at it from the top, um, and I was... 
um, trying to be careful, um, it would be bilaterally symmetric. You'd be able to divide it down the middle. Um, and I'm trying to find a better example of one because most of the time diatoms just go ahead and announce which one they have because they have a, um, a process that runs through the middle of their body called a raphe that actually, and almost all of them actually divides them radially, I mean bilaterally, um, through the diatom. Um, some of them don't have that structure. Um, but maybe it'll be easier if I switch to the non-marine <laughs> uh, plankton sample uh, in order to find one that actually um, has uh, a bilateral symmetry. But um, that's pretty common. Um, let's see, what is this? Uh, Clear Lake. This is a sample from one of my students um, that she lent me. She said, oh, I have a copy of this one. I can lend it to you. And the slide's fine. So we should be able to take a look at it and find something that has bilateral symmetry just so I can make my point. Aha, plenty of things here with bilateral symmetry. So um, let me fix the field of view so you can see stuff and then uh, I'll highlight that just so we, we can have that conversation. But I, I think it's actually pretty interesting because I hadn't thought about it before as a, um, you know, as a, uh, why, why do diatoms have both of those things? Um, and I still don't know, um, you know, like why they might have both strategies versus um, just picking one. So, um, But uh, you asked a question in chat uh, when we were talking about it. You said, um, is that happened pretty high up in the diatoms? Um, and the answer is yes. So I tried to answer that, but I think the chat was moving a little too quickly. And, um, but that is the case. It is a, um, a major division at the very top of um, the highest division possible for diatoms is to split the things that basically have radial symmetry from the things that have bilateral symmetry. And then um, everything after that is um, potentially things could lose something, uh, like a, a lost character. Um, they may lose their bilateral symmetry um, or they may lose their radial symmetry, but um, they belong with those things. So. Um, this is an example. You could fold this thing. If you were making a snowflake on a piece of paper, you could only fold it along this axis right here through the middle. And if you tried to fold it this way, it would not make a perfect snowflake. In other words, not a mirror plane that you could run through this diatom in any other direction than this direction. It's the only way you could, could cut it. So clearly bilaterally symmetrical. Um, and I would say that most of the things that are bilaterally symmetrical, um, I think this is true, are benthic organisms, the things that live attached to a substrate. And most of the things that are plankton generally are um, radial symmetry. Um, but there's a reason why you, you know, some, someone in your chat was asking about why, why would things have uh, symmetry? Why is it useful? And if you think about, um, I had a really cool conversation with one of my students once who's a a computer modeler uh, he likes to make 3d models of diatoms and he was talking about um, if you're trying to code like genetically code an organism um, the amount of information that you need when you start using symmetry is reduced if every one of your limbs was a different shape and stuck out in a different angle and had different kind of components to it then you would need to have you know, genetic information for every one of those appendages. But when you have uh, bilaterally symmetry, bilater bilateral symmetry, I only need the code for half of my body. So my genetic code could actually be reduced in terms of the total amount of information that's needed. I only need to know how to make one arm because I can make an opposite arm that's basically a mirror of the first one. And I only need to know how to make one leg because I can make two. Or if I'm a starfish, I only need to know how to make one structure and then I can just repeat it and so it's an interesting from a genetic point of view because you can make a complicated organism with less genetic information I don't know if there's a purpose for that but you can think about it that way right it's very efficient and most things that have 
um, you know, that symmetry, you can actually make more of it with less code because you have the same code, you're just rotating it, right? Um, and organisms know how to, to generate their skeletal structures um, through that code. So um, it's an interesting concept of like trying to be efficient with the, the genetic information. I don't know that there's a, um, you know, like a bigger concept for that. Um, I haven't thought about it enough and I don't know enough um, uh, about genetic stuff, but it, it would be a really interesting conversation to have with like evil Aussie. And maybe you mean evil Aussie on a panel talking about like, what could you do with this kind of concept? Because, um, you know, from the genetic side, is there really pressure to have efficient DNA code? I mean, I, I can't imagine that there is, but it, I've, it feels like maybe it's a byproduct rather than efficiency. Like, um, one of the things that happens with organisms that have segmented bodies, it's the same way, like uh, worms or uh, anything that has segmented bodies, like insects. Um, if you damage the code genetically, and it's just repeating itself, right? Um, potentially, you could still make that and be survivable. Like, you could add a second set of, of arms onto a human um, that came out, you know, from a different place, and that organism probably would survive, and maybe it would be beneficial. So there might be a case for, um, for having DNA f um, where the code is replicated, um, you know, through damage somehow, actually make it beneficial for the organism. So I, that's a possible um, uh, explanation, but I, I don't know enough about the other side of things. I only know my little window, right? So it'd be cool to have a conversation like that. Um, I think it'd be fun. Yeah, we could do that. Uh, maybe we should talk to Evil Ozzy and see if we can get some sort of a, a little panel, get some of the science streamers. I know that the um, the Knowledge Foundation did that um, occasionally. I know that um, we had a stream that was me and Pacific Plankton and Constababble and uh, Del Maximum was our moderator. Um, and I thought it was a great conversation. We, we had so much fun doing it as well. So I think it might be fun to do something like that again. We probably just need to organize it either ourselves or, or ask um, the Knowledge Fellowship if they would be interested in, um, in hosting it. Um, I think Danny probably has some uh, insight into how we could get that to happen. Um, so it would be fun. It would be, definitely be a thing I'd be interested in doing. Um, and I think it would be a great educational tool um, to just sort of express um, with the viewers how we approach problems like that and how you could see basically both sides of that um, but you need to kind of have a, a wide understanding of science to make those connections and to sort of sort out what might be valuable so um, all of these diatoms that we're seeing are bilaterally symmetrical I think it's almost all the same species this is uh, epithemia um, epithemia are characterized by I've just been talking about whatever comes to mind tonight, which is totally fine. Um, epithemia uh, are these guys. Um, in that little picture at the bottom down here, um, you can actually see that's the one we're looking at. It's that guy right there. It's the same one. Um, uh, epithemia have a raphe, which is this process on the valve face that the diatoms use to crawl around when they have one. And um, it, it runs along the margin on the outside edge and then it moves towards the middle of the valve and then moves back out to the outside margin, which is a characteristic of epithemia. And then um, the other characteristics that separate it from many of the other diatoms in terms of the genus is um, they have costi, which are like, just that's just a science way of saying uh, a rib of silica that runs along the length of the inside of the valve. Um, it sort of divides up the inside of the cell wall into these little long chambers. Um, this is uh, sets of costi that are running all along it, giving them sort of zebra stripe structure. And then these little boxy things are the areoli and the striae are made up of areoli. So um, for these, you could usually tell what species they are by looking at the number of costi in 10 microns. We would measure, for example, the density of the costi and we would look at how many striae or how many of these sets of dots in rows 
um, occur between each of the costi. So for this one, I think you would agree with me, there are usually either two or three of the little boxy things that go between each of the costi. So this one has three, this one has two, this is two, this has three rows, this has two rows, two rows, this one has three rows, two rows. Um, there may be an occasional four that gets stuck in there. And you can actually use that to, um, to help figure out what the species is. Another characteristic for the species identification of epithemia is the shape, the outside shape. Hello? Sorry. Are you sneaking in? Yeah. We were looking at some of your samples earlier. Um, I have a slide I made from one of your samples. Um, you know, you have just the... It's sitting in the hood at school? No, it's on one of the countertops in there. Um, the other thing that you can use to help you identify it is how far does the raphe go from the margin in towards the, the center of the, um, the diatom. So if it comes about halfway, we get this one. Um, but sometimes these come all the way up. In different species, they might come all the way across, or they might just barely come into the center. So you can use those, um, the depth at which the raphe sort of reaches into the center of the valve to help you identify them to species. So, mind of a snail, hello, how are you? It's been so long since you've streamed. Um, I, it's been almost a whole month uh, since we saw you last. Um, does it look like a fl fancy glass mustache? Well, that's a great question. Um, there's only one way for us to tell, and that's, um, I suspect to try to see, um, so I don't want to do that. I want to just turn it a little bit. Turning it's not very easy to do without a screwdriver though. Um, what we should do though is, uh, is put a mustache on it. You know, if we put it, a mustache on a diatom that looks like a mustache, uh, we'll know for sure whether it looks like a mustache, right? Uh, I was playing tricks like this, Tiny Ron This Devil. kind of mustache? Or maybe this, yeah, more like this kind of mustache, right? Mustache! <laughs> there we go. Oh, you want the French mustache. Okay, well, we can do that. Uh, we'll get rid of that one. And uh, we'll just, we'll put a little mustache on it. And, uh, and then we'll see how it goes. And then if you think it looks like a mustache, there's only one way to tell. Um, that's to put an actual mustache on it. And, um, you know, part of my total joy here is uh, learning to put mustaches on diatoms. Uh, let's see, let's do like maybe 220. No, that's the wrong way. That's like upside down mustache. I don't want that. Uh, that one's still upside down. I need it to be like uh, 300. Maybe. Huh, getting closer. 310. It's a 310. There we go. We've got the mustache. Uh, I don't know that we can zoom out any further, but um, we got these googly eyes we have to place as well. So let's, uh, do you think it should be, let's see, who asked me for the, the googly eyes? Mind of a snail. Uh, where do you think the eyes should be? Like out here on the outside edge or in here, like uh, like more normal eyes would be? Like, like this? I feel like the mustache is appropriately scaled, but maybe it could come down a little bit. Yeah, like make it a little bit more, take up a little less of the face. What do you think we should do with the with the eyes, though? <laughs> Both works for you. Uh, as long as it's symmetrical, I'm with you exactly. Uh, uh, feeling that is actually a great uh, observation. It just has to be symmetrical, and then we'll feel okay about it. You like widen everything, like you like the eyes out here, out oh, oh, here like that, like super wide eyes. And then I think I think probably it needs to be a little they need to be a little bit bigger. Like maybe like that. Super wide uh, big eyes. And as long as it's symmetrical or kinda close to symmetrical, right? Then I think we're doing okay. 
like this. And then what I want people to do is, <laughs> it's like a character said from the Cartoon Network, exactly. Uh, and then you should be able to type uh, a googly in the chat, and then you should be able to make its eyes Google, Google around. Um, that's just uh, how we roll around. No, googly, googly. It has to have a Y, uh, not Google. There you go. There you go. And then it'll just keep spinning uh, as much as you want. Um, that's a, a, a reward. I don't know how that's rewarding for people other than I find it hilarious. Um, and for some reason, other people find it hilarious. We can put googly eyes on anything, uh, diatoms especially. So, um, uh, let's see, where are we? Um, thank you. Uh, let's see, thanks for uh, using your channel points for that, of course. Uh, you missed, you've been online, you've been offline, you've missed everyone. You're back this Sunday for sure. Okay, well, if you, um, if you like, um, great music combined with very funny, uh, entertaining puppetry, uh, then, uh, Mind of the Snail is the right place to be. Uh, they stream on Sunday nights, and only Sunday nights, usually, and, um, it's one of my favorite places to hang out on Sunday night. It helps me prepare for the following week. I've had no preparation for the following week for three weeks now. Um, so, you know, there's a deficit in my, uh, in my hilarity budget. And, um, and so it's important that they're back. Um, when, when I was on Mind of a Snail's uh, stream, I built this, uh, this thing, um, which is, Oh, is it even working? Maybe it's not working. Uh, oh, no, it's working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I built this thing, which is basically me as a puppet. And um, when I talk, it talks. And um, I thought this was a lot of fun. And uh, you could just put the mask on, and then I could start talking. And and then the, the mouth of the diatom would move. This is... Uh, um, my character Mustachio, who's one of the emotes we have in this channel, and uh, <laughs> it's the, it's definitely the only um, diatom VTuber uh, that you'll ever find. I don't think any of my colleagues even know what uh, what it means when uh, when I tell them, "Oh, I've got a Twitch channel where I put diatoms on, and I fill a room full of like 30 or 40 people." As we look at diatoms, they don't believe me, uh, for one, um, and for <laughs> and for the other, uh, I was talking with one of my colleagues about um, how um, you know I stream not f not too frequently, but at least once a week um, if I can help it, and then um, and and that I have a you know like almost, I guess I have 2,700 or something followers like that. It's not a huge number, um, but they really, they had a hard time believing that I had that many people that were interested in just sitting around listening to me blab about diatoms. Um, it's a lot more understandable to have somebody tell you that they are interested in sitting around listening, uh, listening to dinosaurs because we have a, our bias towards large organisms. And um, to be honest, they look like dragons and cool creatures whereas diatoms just look like weird symmetrical things. But, um, you know, and they're, they're tiny and invisible for most people without a microscope. So, um, there might have been amoeba-like VTubers a long time ago. It's not really, I, so when I say this is VTubing, people get, like, they get really crazy and go, that's PNG tubing. Um, because I guess it matters whether you say V or PNG or whatever. The idea is that it's just a, an avatar. Anyway, you can pop it off. I'll just have to shake really hard, and then basically it pops off my face, and I can go back to ducking normal. It goes back in the corner, you know. So, um, you know, it, it's disorienting uh, to hear my voice coming out of a cartoon character's face. So, um, diatoms look like art to you. Yeah, I agree, and uh, especially to me because I colorize them and turn them into art, actual artwork that I do. Um, uh, that's mostly just for fun. I made it because I was doing a thing, a collaboration with Mind of a Snail, and I wanted to try it out, and then uh, it was hilarious to me, so I kept it. Um, I just recently bought a, uh, I bought some of my merchandise from Redbubble channel, um, just because I wanted to have some stuff, and 
uh, I bought this uh, Mustachio t-shirt and um, when it came the Mustachio was supposed to be in the middle of the t-shirt but it was like off to one side like really asymmetric and I thought I don't know if I can can wear it like that like it's it's not in the center um, so I sent them a message and I said uh, this isn't the way this is supposed to look and I know because it's my store and that's my artwork on there and uh, they said oh we'll just send you another one no problem so they're gonna send me another one and I thought oh, well now I've got a shirt I'm gonna have a second shirt one of them's gonna be in the center and one of them's gonna be asymmetric um, but I thought I'll just give the asymmetric one away so um, if you're interested in having a mustachio t-shirt um, we'll probably do a giveaway for it and um, and then I'll just let you know in advance um, it's a little off-center and uh, if you're a little off-center you probably won't mind at all so um, yeah uh, somebody uh, changed Claire's purple into um, a green earlier they, they changed me my algal color uh, the green one um, that was Imanoli uh, Imanoli, you took your life in your own hands when you did that, because if Clara was still here, she would have been livid. But uh, it turns out when I shook off the mustachio face, it turned back to purple, which is, uh, there's a really, there's a low probability of that happening. Uh, there's like a 20% chance of it being purple. And then a second time where it turned purple. Um, so that would be 20% of 20%. So pretty, pretty low number, right? Anyway, um, you want that t-shirt? All right, um, we'll, we'll have some sort of a contest for it. Um, we did a coloring contest before, and I might try to do another coloring contest. Um, and then I usually let my daughter judge the contests. Um, but we might also do a, just a raffle sort of thing as well. Um, we'll see if, what we can manage. Um, my stream is very fancy. Which part, the mustache? Because I think we had mustaches the whole time. Um, pretty early on, I started putting mustaches on things. Um, or do you just mean the bubble? The, the bubble is, uh, is fancy. Um, yes, make you do art. I think that's a great plan. Uh, I love the intersection of, of art and science. And I really like educating people about whatever I feel like um, educating them about. And I feel like if, um, if mustaches and googly eyes are the thing that sells people on it, I'll do it. Um, especially if it's googly eyes, because, you know, well, like googly eyes, right? All right, so let's, uh, I'm going to take this slide off. This one is super boring. It's just got the same diatom on, like, everywhere. Um, and it's because it was collected from a, um, a plant, an aquatic plant, which is where these things usually live. And they are the dominant organism in that environment. And so when the slide was made, um, it was made from modern samples. And they're not super interesting as a result because they only have one or two different things on it. Nothing is impossible. I don't know what this is. Not if you can imagine it. 6LT6. It's like a mystery. I put slides together for us to watch and see what they were. I'm going to give some of them to science uh, streams. And then I didn't bother to check out what was on them. Oh, mustache. We don't want the mustache out here just floating in outer space. Uh, let's see. I need to do this. And then this, and then I gotta hide these things. Thank you for spending points on the mustache and uh, and the eyes for everybody's entertainment. Um, and let me see if I can get this into focus for us and see what we're looking at. Oh, oh, this is actually really cool. This is a project that I have an undergrad working on, and we will probably be using some of the the money um, from uh, from the uh, the stream to help support this project. Um, it's a really interesting project to me. Um, I have an undergraduate who's working in my lab um, named Daphne, and I think maybe she hasn't been on any of the streams yet, but she probably will be eventually. Um, and she's working on this project. This is this another diatom that just looks like a mustache, I suppose, um, but bilaterally symmetric. Uh, mustache uh, shape. This one is uh, the diatom's name is Sinidra cyclop cyclopum, and um, we can get a nice close up look at it if I zoom in. Um, what you can see is 
uh, one, it has this sort of banana shape to it. Uh, two, it has little striae that we can see in here. And then a section in the middle where there's no striae, um, or maybe faint um, lines where striae could have been. And otherwise, pretty simple. And um, uh, what's interesting about this is that this diatom, uh, Sinedra cyclopum, only lives on um, copepods and uh, swimming zooplankton in lakes. It is Sinedra. I like your name, yes, cyclopum. It seems like it should have one eye, but it doesn't have any eyes. Um, it's Sinedra and um, is the, the genus, and um, I think Cyclopum's on the web page there. Let me grab it really quickly. Um, so you can, if you feel like maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm not gonna be offended, um, but I'll, I'll just verify for you that this is what we're looking at. Um, this is the, uh, that's the genus page for uh, Sinedra cyclopum, so that we're all on the same page, literally, um, you can see that um, Sinedra cyclopum is, uh, looks exactly like what we're looking at here, banana shaped, a gap in the middle, um, where there's faint striae or no striae, and, um, and then you'll actually see uh, somewhere down here under the ecology, that um, it occurs widespread, dispersed in the plankton of lakes, and then it says the report says that it is often attached to crustacea in cool water. And um, another report that says it's found in lakes of medium electrolyte content where it lives on the backs of copepods. And that is actually the case. Um, this was collected from uh, Gull Lake in California. And um, this diatom, this banana shaped diatom, lives attached to the backs of copepods. And if you don't know what a copepod is, um, hey, Cyanophyte, how's it going? Um, if you don't know what a copepod is, I recommend that you go um, hang out a little bit in Pacific Plankton's channel. Um, she often has live copepods, and you can see them um, from the marine realm, pretty common. They're also common in freshwater systems as zooplankton, things that uh, eat diatoms and, and fish eat them. Um, but the copepods have these things living attached onto them. And this sample was collected from the plankton, of Gull Lake, but the plankton was filled with copepods when we brought the nets up, basically. It was just all copepods. And um, we processed it to get to um, in nitric acid to boil out the skeleton remains of the copepods, and all we had left were just these things, um, which is kind of cool. So um, we know that this diatom was basically living attached to the copepods, because we have some pictures of the carapaces of the copepods with the diatom still attached to them in place and then uh, when we had a sample that was full of copepods we had a sample that was also full of Sinedra cyclopum and um, what this means for me as a paleoecologist is if I'm looking through my samples from this lake and I find a bunch of Sinedra cyclopum that means that we historically would have had more copepods likely present in the water column during the time where we find these. And the advantage of that is, is that diatoms fossilize, but copepods do not. And typically we don't, we can't tell the concentration of copepods. So this actually is a way that we are planning to reconstruct the history of copepod abundance in Gull Lake by looking at a core that we collect from the lake and then counting the um, abundance of these things with the connection that the more of those that we find then likely the more copepods were present in the lake and so it provides a way for us to basically um, I sound a little congested it's because I am just a little congested but um, but I'm okay with uh, sounding congested um, the studio cornix is here one of um, one of my favorite streamers and uh, she also connects um, science and art together um, from the other side. I'm sort of a scientist who does artsy things, and she's sort of an artist that does sciencey things, and so we're like a, a perfect pair um, in my mind. And um, Pacific Plankton is also the same way. She's an artist who does uh, sciencey things. 
So um, I really make nice combinations with those kinds of people um, because I can help them with the science side of things and they can help me by being artists and showcasing all of that um, cool stuff that I, I have, I dabble in, but uh, don't have exactly the types of skills that they do. Um, so, <laughs> um, so the, uh, the value of these is basically we're going to try to reconstruct um, my, my undergrad in my lab who's been in there for one year. She can recognize this diatom um, and that's the only one she needs to know. And we can look through the samples and we just can say diatom or cyclicum. Like just counting the total number is easy. This is an example of something that anyone could potentially do. You don't need to be a specialist to be able to recognize this thing. It's very distinct. It's banana shaped and it has these weird little stripes on it. Um, and it, you are unlikely to confuse it with anything else. And so um, I'm going to train her in identifying these things, and then we're just going to give it a run. No one has ever tried to do this before, by the way. People know that this thing lives on copepods, but most diatomists don't care about the concentration of copepods uh, in lake systems. They are mostly concerned about what are the diatoms telling us, not what are copepods telling us. And um, what I'm interested in is it tells us something about the linkage between the food webs and um, so there's a really interesting aspect of it for me which is that um, that we can use the diatom as a record of a thing that we cannot observe directly um, which is the copepod populations and the copepod populations are probably linked directly to fish populations which we could observe but it's difficult because their fossils are much larger than we typically have material for and so um, this is actually a really interesting concept for me which is to apply something people know something about the ecology of this organism but they're more focused on other things and so they don't really care that much about it and I mentioned this to one of my other paleoecology colleagues and he was like, oh, that's cool. That's a really cool idea. Um, and he was very supportive of it. So I thought, well, we'll give it a try. But we'll probably be using the funding um, from Twitch almost exclusively unless we get a grant. Um, I wrote a little grant to try to cover it and I don't know if it got funded. But if it didn't, we're just going to exclusively use Twitch funding basically to pay for this and then um, uh, I'm almost certain that it's going to come out with some sort of very interesting results. Nobody's tried to do it before, and um, and then uh, we'll almost certainly try to publish it. So uh, we'll be able to get something that basically we developed more or less just by chatting about it, um, and uh, a project that we didn't intend when we started to do this project. We had no um, concept of what, what we might do. Um, hey, how's it going, Froza? Um, sorry, I didn't see you come in. I was busy blabbing. Um, but this is something that happens in science, which is basically a lot of times you don't prepare for everything hey, you might observe. Sour. Hey, thank you for the subscription, Gerbo Potato. It was um, super cool. Um, you don't always know what it is that you're going to get. It's a bit of a surprise. Some of science is exploration. And... So we'll be basically making some connections, but like I don't have, uh, you know, like I have funding for the things that we designed the grant to pay for, which was not this part of the project. And so um, we're going to basically be using some of the Twitch funding uh, to fund Daphne's research. And um, she'll be working on this project, um, getting paid to analyze these samples and then um, if I can help it, she'll either be the first or the second author on the paper, depending on how much she feels about writing about the topic. And then my other graduate student, Laura, um, who has also already been partially funded by our Twitch stuff to do stuff in the scanning electron microscope, um, will also be probably an author on that paper. So really cool. Um, connecting the research of some of my graduate students with some of my undergraduate students, um, giving them some really cool um, scientific research experience and being able to fund it um, mostly by just blabbing at people about things I just already like talking about anyway. So um, a pretty cool um, uh, a system. Um, so uh, 
especially to people like Gerber Potato hey, and Anthologizing and Chippy Flip just now dumped another five <laughs> um, subs on the channel. Um, this is the sort of thing that helps us fund that research. Um, I'm, I mean, honestly, it's nice to be able to do it and not have to scramble around and try and try to find like how are we going to going to get this project funded. It's a pretty cool project. It's going to probably result some um, very interesting aspects and will lead to the student presenting paper at um, maybe the next GSA or uh, or something like that. So keep your eye out for it if you're going to the, any of those national meetings. Um, Froza, what did you get for your spirit guide? I didn't see it. I'm hoping it was a Sinedra. Um, oh, Denticula. All right, there you go. All time from now forward, you will have Denticula guiding you. Um, on your path. Uh, look at all the people who just got subs too. Very cool. Uh, disillusioned and Broken Symmetry are people that are always hanging out in my channel anyway, so they're going to be very excited uh, to find out that they got subscriptions. So, Chippy, chippy Flip, great job. Hey, it's Crossover Carissa. Um, I was earlier, I was hanging out in Crossover Stream. Right before I, um, right before I came here, um, I was uh, listening to her um, sing. She's one of um, uh, one of very cool streamers on Twitch. Uh, I spend a lot of my time hanging out on Twitch in the community. I like to hang out in science channels because I'm a scientist, but I really, really like to hang out in the music channels. And I think most of the music streamers um, have a pretty good handle on uh, on the fact that I'm there they're like who's this weird person who's like a scientist who's hanging out in my uh, my music channel uh, um, I've, I'm very very much uh, excited about music all the time and um, I just think it's brilliant that um, people have an audience you know like I I was a musician um, I was in bands um, when I was in college and a little bit in grad school and um, I mean, we played out at bars to crowds of like 30 people. Uh, we were happy with those kinds of numbers. And um, when I see streamers on Twitch and I think, wow, they're here just like with this massive crowd of people that are um, that are checking out their scene. They can just come from anywhere. You have such a nice audience to be able to pull in, but you're giving them a, um, a free concert, you know, like, a concert that they can go to just every other day or something. It's extremely cool. Um, so what did I play? I was a bass guitarist. Um, and when I was in high school, I did a lot of singing. So I really appreciate your singing. I, I was um, in a small town when I grew up and um, and I was expected to do a bunch of plays because there weren't a lot of people who could sing. And I don't know that I sang that well, but um, my uh, uh, this, the person who was in charge of, uh, of all the musical aspects of plays would constantly tell me if I just had some music lessons I probably could be a great singer. She loved my voice. Um, it's raspy today, but um, she would always just tell me like the quality, the tone of my voice was just amazing and I was like, okay, whatever. I wasn't planning on becoming a singer, but uh, I don't have the, quite the ear for uh, singing a tune very well, so I probably do need lessons. Um, if I wanted to do it, but there's you're right. There's so much good music on uh, on Twitch And I almost always like to if I don't come out of my channel streaming uh, and raid another musician um, either going after an artist uh, a musician or a, and a friend of ours who's doing science or art um, Or music that's basically all I do uh, almost never go into a gaming channel but I almost always end up in either the art streams or the um, or the music streams because I just I love the community and I want to be able to share music with people. Um, I added this thing very recently to my channel, which I'm calling uh, Metronome uh, with a G, which is this. Um, uh, it just randomly uh, blurts out. Uh, you got to go. Yeah, I know how it is when you get to the end. Um, when you get to the. Uh, uh, it has like a little timer, and then I have it randomly select um, for musicians that I um, regularly listen to on Twitch. It's this thing, and it just picks one of the um, people that I follow that's a musician, and it recommends them. And uh, uh, Carissa, you're in that list. So at, um, just randomly, my stream will blurt out, hey, why don't you go give Carissa a follow? Um, 
and it, I really love that you brought your people in here. So um, I'm, I'm super happy that you came through um, and get some, you know, I know how it is. You get to the end of the stream, you just want to like go relax. So um, I'll try to come back and take a look at, uh, at what was going on just um, a second here and try to read a little bit. Um, is it kind of like funding science with science education? A little bit. Um, it's incidental funding. I mean, I can write grants. I often try to write grants to, to fund stuff, but there's not a lot of um, money for science. Um, you know, if you're not in the medical profession, there's a lot more money in medicine. But um, for pure science, for looking at something that's like diatom stuff, um, it's very competitive and difficult to bring in money. Um, so, you know, like getting any money uh, that I can donate. I mean, the thing is, I'm I'm not going to use it. I don't need I don't need somebody to spend five dollars on me. Um, I have a salary. I do a job. Uh, I get paid to do my job. I don't I don't really want the money to come to me. Um, and I was going to stream anyway. So um, I sort of feel it's like an easy way for me to give back to my students who um, who are in my lab. And it seemed like a better cause than um, just giving it to some random organization. So. Um, did you talk about the content of said project? Yeah, we've been talking a little bit about it just now, um, just uh, um, recently, um, but um, uh, we haven't fully developed it, so we'll see. Um, I do have a grant, a small grant, that might fund some of this as well uh, for this particular project, um, but it's it's going to be a fun one, and I'm very interested in seeing what happens. So. Uh, science nerd, what's going on? Yeah, um, thanks again for the raid, Carissa, and um, I will formally give you a little shout out here, uh, Crossover Carissa. Um, and if you don't know who Crossover Carissa is, um, and you're wondering, like, do I want to um, go listen to some random music channel? Um, she's a vocalist. She plays mostly um, keyboards and does loops, and she's got a spectacular singing voice. And um, uh, she does requests. She's uh, she's super friendly. The community there is great. Um, I wouldn't recommend a streamer for music if I didn't think that they had a great community. Uh, and also, Unmagical Me, thank you for um, coming in with the raid. Um, Unmagical Me knows what's up. He's in a lot of, or he or she's in a lot of the um, the music streams I'm in. I have a good sense of uh, of taste. Uh, your favorite is Denticula Criticola. Cret because it looks like a microscope, microscopic submarine. All right. Well, if you looked around in the denticula, um, let's see. Uh, so many of my friends on Twitch are music streamers, and sometimes I do a little bit of woodworking and try to make people things, uh, instruments for for streamer friends of mine. So, uh, you played drums for 15 years, Froza. Nice. I haven't played bass in a long time. I have sort of like arthritic -y hands now. I'm old, so. Um, so, yeah. Uh, singing stream coming. Well, I thought maybe Hannah Rebecca Music was going to come visit me while they were in uh, Wisconsin. She threatened to, and we had plans, and then she just decided she wasn't going to do any streaming for a while. So we kind of missed it. But I thought I was going to have to sing if that happened. So, But I also thought I would have to practice a little bit. We'll see. Um, very, very cool. All right. Uh, if you love music streams, oh, that was me. Yeah, it was Calvin Thomas. It was just an example. I um, also feel like I'm participating in scientific research. Yeah, exactly. That's um, that's part of the cool part of, um, of what's going on. So, um, oh, did it just come up? Oh, that was mine. Yeah, okay. Um, it would have been a lot of fun. Um, we could have had dueling kalimbas. Um, why not fund Razor special music stream? <laughs> like invite music streamers and do a multi-stream stuff. That would be really fun. I don't know if I could convince that many streamers to uh, music streamers to do something um, to do a fundraiser. But I like organizing people. Um, at some point, I would really wanted to do a um, uh, like a 24-hour microscope stream collection. Um, where it would start with like Dell Maximum and then come to me and then I would give it to Pack and then we'd give it to like whoever. We'd end up with like Spider ID and Studio Cornix and like all the might We just hand it as a raid train from one to the next. Um, I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, let's see. Uh, diatoms do have special xanthophils specific to them. Yes. 
Thayo's Anthony, yes. Um, we should do that. Um, we had, you know, when we first started on Twitch, um, when I first started on Twitch, there was like three people who had used microscopes to stream onto Twitch, and it was like a, a tiny world who's the person who got me into streaming on Twitch. Um, just bas basically putting a microscope in, and showing water bears and some rotifers and things. Uh, OpenSet, uh, who still streams, but very rarely um, anymore. Um, and uh, a tiny world hasn't streamed in, I think, a year uh, at least. But uh, she was amazing and got me interested in doing this. Uh, she talked me into putting my SEM on uh, on Twitch. And, uh, and then... Uh, Pacific Plankton, who started just a little before me, uh, who I was watching and also thought, okay, I can do this, because um, I, I don't, uh, I know it seems like I'm pretty calm talking in front of people because it's my job, but um, the idea of like putting my face up and constantly talking in front of people was not appealing to me at first, um, and it's still not all that appealing to me, but, um, I realized that having my face showing is probably more appealing to people than just only the microscope stuff. Um, so, uh, but there wasn't that many of us, right? Talking to people is kind of challenging. Um, and being able to talk, I don't know, I've been streaming for two hours and 30 minutes almost, and I haven't shut up. So um, talking to myself for two and a half hours while I'm answering questions uh, in a room, uh, with just me and a microscope, it's intimidating to think about doing that. So, um, but I think it's actually made me a little bit better at communicating with the general public, um, which is important for me uh, as a scientist. I think it's actually really critically important to be able to talk to the general public, and I think that's another thing why um, Danny brought in a whole bunch of people earlier. Um, uh, if, and if you're not following paleontologizing, you should be. Um, and he's been hanging out here. I think he eventually. Uh, signed off, but maybe he's lurking in the background. Um, but he um, brought a whole bunch of people over and then just hung out and chatted with me about really cool stuff, um, which is nice. It's nice to be able to, like, just have a dialogue about interesting things um, with scientists sometimes on, on Twitch as well. Um, as much as I also just like talking to average people, I think it's kind of cool to have a dialogue in front, of, um, in front of people so they can kind of see scientific thought and process. So... Um, Pass the baton. It's a it's a fun way to do it to do like a ray train. Yeah. Um, uh, when I socialize, I have to stay silent and alone, recharge my batteries. That's actually me. Um, I spend most of my time with my headphones on. I don't want anybody to talk to me. I just want to be like quiet and doing my work. And um, uh, I think that um, I think that uh, that that it's a challenge to be around people for me. Um, it's, it's um, you know, it doesn't seem like it is, uh, but it, it, it's actually, it's not something that I crave. Um, it's more the other way around. I'm definitely an introverted type personality, and like in big rooms full of people, I usually try to find a corner and hide. So, um, <laughs> um, I didn't mean average in terms of your abilities on magical me, but um, if you want to take it away, you can. You're an extra extrovert. Uh, so the pandemic isolation has been hell. Yeah, I can see how that would be. Um, when when the pandemic first started, uh, I feel like it's ended for us, and I'm gonna hit that for a second. I know it hasn't, but I feel like it's ended where I live. Um, so when it first started, the neighbors were like, oh, how are you guys putting up with the fact that you don't have anybody around and whatever else? I was like, oh, no, this is good. I don't mind this at all. Like, I could live in my house with just my microscope and my music and my kid and my wife, and I don't need the rest of you. Um, uh, it was totally fine for me. I, I had no problem living in total isolation like that. I would make a great hermit, um, you know, like... If I could just find some quiet wood space where I could also have internet and a microscope uh, and an SEM, but um, uh, it it didn't bother me at all. I know there's a lot of people I had a really negative effect for. Um, today, here in the county that I live in, um, I think three or four days ago, they said after 780 some days in a row, we have no cases of uh, hospitalized people for COVID in our county anymore 
and our COVID numbers in the county are generally hovering around zero, um, with occasionally one or two cases being reported like once a week. Um, none of our, um, our universities dropped the mask policy. Everything is basically back to normal here. Um, so like we are essentially um, past it at this point. I don't know if it'll recur. I mean, if it does, I think we're all prepared for that as a possibility. But um, here in Indiana, in this little part of the world, we are, uh, nobody comes here apparently. Um, but um, I've, I feel like I've just, we're past it. Um, you, you don't, I mean, if there's one or two cases in the county um, being reported every couple of days, I feel like I don't need to wear a mask anymore. I'm vaccinated. The concentration of um, the viral load is so small at that point um, that there's almost no chance that I could get infected. I would have to be exposed to somebody who was definitely positive for a fairly long time, um, probably to, to because I'm triple vaccinated or whatever. Um, it, it would be challenging uh, to basically, I'd have to work at trying to get infected where I am right now. And as we just talked about, I'm kind of an introvert. So like I teach my lecture and then I go back and hide in my office or one of my labs. I don't uh, socialize with people very much. So, um, but I'm thankful about that. Um, and I know that's not the case everywhere in the US, but that is the case here. Yeah, and we have a pretty small county. So, um, and I'm in a rural place for the most part. So, um, and I don't mean to, to um, minimize the effects of it. I'm still aware that there's a pandemic going on, but I feel like I'm Taiwan or something where basically there's been almost no cases. Um, because we're down to that point where it's not really a big deal. And when I hear somebody cough, I usually go, oh, that person has a cold. Um, if it had been a year ago and somebody coughed, I'd have been running for the other side of the room, right? Um, so, and we have all of these uh, COVID kits that uh, for testing that my wife has been, um, you know, like when she sees them become available, she goes and buys some of them just because. And every time she gets something like a sinus infection or cold or something she takes a test and it's like it always comes out negative um, and I'm just like yeah, I, don't, I don't think we're in a, a place where you could really get COVID right now so I'm happy about that um, it's it's a break um, for me to not feel like I'm uh, in a pandemic and constantly in fear of illness but um, I definitely know that it's it's not that way everywhere so um, you're in a region that has lots of cases, but you still feel a bit hopeful that it will fully end by the fall. I don't know. It seems like it's definitely declining in most places. Um, pandemic isolation has you burnt out. Lab, lab hermit life. Yeah, I had to blast music and make things more lively during the last semester. When it first started, I was doing a lot of, um, I was doing like, you know, Zoom kind of um, hangouts and, um, just to kind of see people and chat with them a little bit. Um, and I hadn't seen my family in a while, which, you know, like I don't care about talking to my neighbors so much, but um, not getting to see my, my family is usually a bit of a challenge. So, but they're all, um, you know, they're all vaccinated and um, double vaccinated and triple vaccinated or whatever by this point. So um, there's not a lot of threat for them either. Um, I just have one more slide I want to look through before I decide which one of these I want to send off to science. Um, I think we've looked through all of the other ones, and I just wanted to take a quick look at it. Sorry about the blinding light. That wasn't my intention. Um, just trying to uh, see if there's good things in here. Um, earlier in the stream, we were talking about uh, other things that we find in the samples, uh, let me fix this. I need to, uh, yeah. Um, we were talking about other things that we find in the samples that aren't diatoms, and the, the samples are digested in nitric acid or hydrogen peroxide and nitric acid. Um, and so um, most of the things that are organic get dissolved um, or oxidized in that process. Um, and it mostly leaves behind things like silica, but sometimes pollen is um, really resistant. Anyway, we talked a little bit about chrysophytes earlier in the um, in the stream, and these are all chrysophytes. Uh, these little spiny things here, they look like globes. 
Um, they really look more like Christmas tree ornaments, as we'll see in the scanning electron microscope. These are apertures or openings, and you'll always find an ap aperture or an opening um, in a chrysophyte stomatocyst. Um, you might not be able to see it if it's on the other side of, um, of the sphere, but they're spherical shaped and they have a little opening. There's this one, here's the one on this one, there's the one on this one. Um, that'll let you very easily tell that you're looking at a chrysophyte stomatocyst versus something else. And one of the things that you can see in this sample is that there are a lot of chrysophyte stomatocysts. Here's a whole bunch more. And um, we're still at 40x, so I'm going to uh, 400 times magnification. So I'm going to, real quick, um, throw it into um, oil immersion. This. Uh, juggling two things at once um, so that we can see those things a little bit more closely and clearly um, but there's a whole little cluster of different chrysophyte stomatocysts and I need to do this thing again because brightness doesn't know how to adjust itself without it um, but you can see all of those little um, spherical things have um, have uh, openings in them here's the opening here's an opening here's an opening there's an opening. Sometimes they have little spines and things around them. Um, but these are um, fixed samples, so we're able to look at them with uh, oil immersion very easily. And this is a thousand times magnification with, uh, with my camera sort of stacked on top of it with doing a little bit of magnif additional magnification. Um, they're not a crystal formation. They're an organism. Um, they are... Uh, a type of golden algae and um, looks like a dumbbell. There are some uh, um, phytoliths that look exactly like dumbbells. It's actually just two spherical things in that case. Um, they look a little dumbbell shaped, but um, this one is a chrysophyte. It's a little asymmetric, uh, like a plum. Um, and then these ones are also all chrysophytes. So the sample just had tons of chrysophytes, more chrysophytes than diatoms, I think, um, which is fine. Uh, here's some more chrysophytes. There's a diatom that is uh, Pinularia borealis. This is uh, a stack of... Uh, ooh, I don't know what that is. Uh, Pseudostar syra brevistraeta, I think. Um, there is a Simbaplura... Um, and these are pieces of pine pollen right here, this yellowy colored stuff um, that you're seeing is this, a shredded piece of pine pollen. Those are some chrysophyte cysts in them. Um, that's a pinularia piece, that's a cerarella piece, uh, just a fragment. There's a, another chrysophyte, that one's got all kinds of dynamic spiny things sticking off of it. That is a uh, Solophora levissima. Um, this is a uh, Cymbella, I don't know uh, what the species for that is, it looks like maybe it's Symbiformis. Um, this is a piece of a Nidium. This thing over here is a little tiny Gomphonema. There's a bunch of little Chrysophytes in there. Uh, that's a, that little Gomphonema again right there, tiny, tiny little Gomphonema. Um, that leaf-shaped thing. Uh, Cerarellas. Um, some more chrysophyte cysts, that's an Oligocyra cluster right there, a colony, uh, that is, uh, that's Oligocyra valida. Um, there's a, uh, an Epithemia gibba, just a piece of one. Um, one of the things is that, um, this is a sample that I've, um, my materials, so I can very quickly tell you what the species are for most of the things in here because I counted it. Um, I counted it like 15 years ago, but um, I still counted it. And most of the things I still know their names. Um, that is uh, a piece of a sponge spicule. So sponges put uh, nasty little toothpick shaped spines inside their body made out of silica. You can tell it's a sponge spicule because it has this structure, which is called an axial canal runs down the middle of it. Sometimes people confuse sponges with diatoms because diatoms can be long toothpick shaped or banana shaped things, but a diatom will never have a axial canal running down the middle of the silica. And then of course these are solid silica. You can see that here that there's no holes or openings. 
um, and that blue color that you're seeing or, or purpley color you're seeing right in there um, is just a refraction of the light so um, uh, do they st generally stay in a colony? Uh, the diatoms that live in a colony, um, the Olicosyra that live in a colony, they have specialized spines that they use to hold on to the neighboring uh, siblings in the colony. That's a nice uh, epithemia gibba right there. Um, sometimes you can see those epithemia gibba in their living states on Studio Cornex's streams. Studio's had some housing issues that's made her very angry and left her unable to stream for most of the week. Um, but uh, hopefully they've been resolved. Yesterday we had all kinds of drama. Apparently the SWAT were in her neighborhood uh, swatting some people. Um, this uh, little thing right here is a, a Pseudostarosyra um, pumula. I think it's the um, species. <laughs> You're angry. Uh, that dude went to jail. Okay, good. Because he was, uh, it seemed like he was being defiant uh, with the authorities. Never a good plan. Um, always when the SWAT team shows up, you should just let them take you because they're going to take you eventually. I don't know what you think is going to happen, but you're not getting out of that one. Um, that's some little interesting chrysophyte cysts. There's a lot of really weird ones. This is one, and this is another stomatocyst. Uh, this one has uh, ridges, like spiraling ridges that are going around the outside of it. It's not super clear from this field of view um, that that's what's going on, but but through optical dissection I can tell um, that it, it has a bunch of spiraling ridges that... So it, right here is the aperture, and then the spirals are all coming around uh, the, the valve like this, and then this one just has like a reticulated surface, which you can see right here very easily. Um, a little bit more clearly visible in the in the microscope itself, though. Doing some work and lurking. Did I just hear they tried swatting Studio? No, not Studio. Her neighbor. Uh, he was holding his girlfriend hostage. Oh, he sounds like a charming person. It sounds like maybe he deserves to go to uh, a little quiet place where he can uh, think about what he's done. <laughs> um, holding his girlfriend hostage. I think you probably mean his ex-girlfriend. Um, I'm just gonna guess. Uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna guess that uh, step one in girlfriend maneuvers is don't hold them hostage. Uh, this is Pinularia again, Borealis. Uh, Pinularia Borealis is an aerophytic diatom. Um, it sounds like a. Uh, he sounds like a. A great guy. I don't know why he's got to hold his girlfriend hostage. Um, he seems like he's very charming. Um, ooh, that's a big diatom. It's a giant old Cerarella just taking up most of the field of view right there. I think it's Cerarella, not Iconella, but I think that's a Cerarella now. Still, there's a chrysophyte inside the Cerarella, and there's a little diatom. That's also a diatom. This whole thing is a diatom. Uh, and if we had one of those marine diatoms in here, we would just be sitting on top of one of those and, uh, and show you how huge they can be. Um, where'd the sample come from? The sample is uh, from a bog in the San Juan Mountains up in the high elevation area in a place called Cumbers, Cumbers Bog, or Cumbrae's Bog. I don't know how it's pronounced. Um, and it was the subject of a paper that we published um, in 2012. And um, uh, it's in my research uh, portfolio down there somewhere. If you click on the research button under the About Me thing, you should be able to find it and download it. Um, I think the lead author, uh, um, I'm not the lead author, I'm just a component of it. But I do talk about the diatom record a little in it. And um, this is from the past when the bog was actually a lake, which is part of my interpretation. Um, this is Calanese. Uh, it has this uh, triundulate shape, so undulation, undulation, undulation. And uh, it looks like a circus peanut, or uh, double e circus, double, double peanut. Um, and then this is Calanese. I believe it's Silicula, but I could be wrong about that. It could be Schumannia. Um, it's one of those two probably though. Um, 
and I counted these while I was counting my dissertation uh, as extra work because apparently counting 2,000 diatom slides wasn't enough for me um, and I needed to have at least another 60 or 70 slides that had nothing to do with my dissertation that I could count at the same time because um, that's what I was doing. This one's got these really cool little wicked spines coming off the back side of it. There's the uh, I think that's the aperture over here, and those wicked little spines are like sticking off the bottom of it. Um, I also counted another 500 slides uh, during my dissertation from Flathead Lake um, and the river systems around Flathead from modern collections um, on top of the 2,000 slides that I counted. And uh, I left a hole uh, when I graduated that no one can ever fill. Um, my PhD advisor is just like you've wrecked everything for everyone who's ever come through here because uh, no one has ever counted 2,000 diatom slides from a single site before in the lake system history and I did that for my PhD and then another 500 plus another 100 um, from two unrelated projects so um, everybody who comes through there after me is very mad at the fact that I did all of that um, because they're like, I just want to count like a normal amount. Um, but I really like diatoms. That's all I can say about that. I wasn't trying to break records or anything. It just happened. Uh, these little cystula things here. I think that's Cymbella cystula. These are the um, uh, stigmoids. Stigma stigmoids. Um, and they... Um, are on the ventral side, on the belly, instead of on the back. Um, we often look at, on this channel, we look at Afrocymbella, which have its stigma on uh, the dorsal side. Um, Cymbella always on the ventral side. I just got carried away. I just liked what I was doing. Uh, what's wrong with that? Um, do you use any vision tools like ImageJ? Uh, that's a good question. Chippy Flip, when I was a graduate student, we did use vision, uh, we did use ImageJ. Um, to measure things. Um, when we first learned diatoms, we used ImageJ as our primary tool for that um, because we didn't have access to high-powered computer um, programs. But um, this is a Leica, um, the DM2500, and I have software in my lab that will allow us to measure um, the same way. Um, that came with the computer but is integrated so I don't have to do any thinking. I can just draw a scale bar and it will tell me how, um, how big that is. Um, and it's calibrated for every one of the different um, objectives and it will also measure things like area and you can count um, features so that you don't have to track it in your brain. So if you were trying to, um, for example, count how many of the uh, areoli are in this row, um, you can go put like click, 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 and it will count and then tell you how many you counted. Um, but ImageJ is the tool that we started with, and um, we would use it regularly. And um, so I learned how to do stuff on ImageJ, and then um, quickly decided that I liked the. Uh, I don't know how much money they spend on. You have to spend like four or five thousand dollars for the software that comes with the microscope. Um, it's really expensive because they got you, you know, over a barrel with it. Um, but um, I decided I liked it a lot better, and since we already had bought it, uh, I was just going to use that instead of going back to ImageJ. On my home computer here, um, the one that we're looking at stuff with this microscope that's here from, uh, you know, I'm borrowing it from my lab, but my wife is mostly counting on it um, on the desktop behind me, so I just bring it over here. Hey, Shafard, how's it going? Um, how are you doing? Hopefully that rest of the anniversary stream you were doing turned out pretty well. The um, South Park game you were playing made me laugh a lot. Um, uh, we don't have it hooked up to any of the softwares or computers. I just have it hooked up to the camera that you can see up here mounted on the top of uh, the microscope. And um, the images are calibrated after we take them. We have a stage... Um, stage micrometer so we can take a picture of it and then take a picture of our samples and, um, and we can just use the pixel number counts to measure it if we need to 
Um, more typically what I would do is if it was something I wanted to take real pictures for, for publication or for statistical analysis, I would take it back to the lab and do them there. Um, and the pictures that we collect with this one are mostly for um, building a reference guide. If you know she wanted to, um, if she wants to take some pictures so she has them, we have a camera mounted on it. Um, and then um, once you have the, you know, the microscope set up and the camera set up the same way, the pictures are all the same magnification because it's just pixels, right? Um, it's not 1.5 times, it's 1.5 times 1,000 times, so that's actually 1,500 times um, magnification. Um, so do not be deceived by uh, the mere 1.5. That's my camera's magnification of the image that you're seeing. So I can zoom out, and now we're just looking at 1,000 times magnification. This is a, a fun little diplonese right here. Um, I like being zoomed in because the zoom actually is a lot clearer um, on this camera when you're using it on a microscope. And um, the, the image looks a lot cleaner for people at home. Um, there's not as much diffraction uh, as I get closer. And um, the optical zoom on my camera has better magnification and better resolution than, um, than the actual uh, camera that came with the microscope by a lot. So as I zoom in, we don't actually get any loss of resolution because um, it, it can't really happen to us. So um, the, this is a um, 20 megapixel camera and you need something like five megapixels at 1000 times magnification uh, to, <laughs> uh, to see things clearly. So uh, no matter what I do, I can't really reach the, um, the magnification that we need, uh, the limit of it. Um, oh, there's another giant uh, Cerarella. And then it's sitting right next to this little epithemia right there. Oops, you can't see the epithemia because we're zoomed in too far. Got those eyeballs going, chef. Um, it was really funny. Uh, just hanging out in your stream. I'd never seen that game before, but uh, just watching you break stuff is hilarious. So, um, Keons makes some pretty cool stitching tools for making images of huge areas, yes. Um, there's a tool that people use. I can't remember the name of it, um, but they, they basically have um, microscopes that are set up to, to take um, in... You can call me Jeffrey, that's fine. Um, I mean, that's my name. Um, that game was a riot, yeah. Um, the, um, I can't remember the name of that software, but they have these microscopes that are set up to, they'll just take pictures and, um, and move automatically across the slide and they'll just keep taking pictures and then it stitches the whole thing together. And, um, and it has to do it uh, the image is z-stacked and then it's moved and then z-stacked and then moved and then z-stacked and then moved so that everything is in um, in uh, same focal height uh, so all of the images basically they won't look normal the diatoms actually won't have um, the normal um, a depth of focus so like I can tell the shape of things by um, by using optical dissection, dissection. Um, you wouldn't be able to do it with those images. So things that had a hump basically would look kind of flattened, but um, or they would to me. They might not. That they would look abnormally flat from the way that I'm used to looking at them. Um, but the uh, the um, the tool then would allow researchers to go through and circle all the diatoms of the same species, for example, and it's a really neat system um, because you can collaborate with other people. You can all look at this thing that's in shared space and then decide which things you think belong to the same species. Um, and I wish I had one of those microscopes that could scan and take one of those pictures and stitch it together. Um, I don't have that kind of money and neither does my university. And while I think it would be really, really cool to do, um, you know, it's it's like an excessive um, instrument. Like we can do that as humans. We don't necessarily need to have that kind of a tool to do that. 
um, but it is super cool. Um, and I think they t um, one of my friends uh, was involved with it. It's in some sites that where they're specializing in doing this sort of stuff uh, in Germany or Austria. And um, my friend Hannah, um, who's German, um, a native German, um, is uh, was working with them and promoting it and talking with people about how they could use it and was showcasing some of the stuff that um, she and I were collaborating on to showcase it to me. So, uh, yeah, this is a nice, um, a cool epithemia. This is uh, epithemia sorex, I believe. Um, it's either sorex, no, I'm pretty sure that's sorex. Um, let's see, this is epithemia. Uh, I didn't even have to look it up. Oh, I need to spell things correctly. Epithemia. There we go. Uh, you didn't need to look up the fact that it was epithemia, or you didn't need to look up the fact that it's sor thor sorex. Because uh, if you knew it was sorex, that's pretty good. Um, that's in that's in the realm of uh, yeah. This is sorex. I'm pretty sure. So. Um, We'll bring that back to the Twitch channel here. Didn't have to look up everything. Still an accomplishment, um, but it's good that you can identify them. No idea of the species. Well, this one looks like Captain Crunch Hat, uh, so that's how I usually remember it. Sorex is a Captain Crunch Hat. Um, uh, let's double check that ID, though. Oh no, I think it's right. This one actually just slightly different shaped. Um, let me see what else we have for epithemia. I would start with Sorex, basically, as, uh, as my first guess. And I was playing tricks. Oh, like it's going to get googly devil. eyes, huh? We could do that again. Um, the more I stream, the more. It's a mustache hat. You can't unsee it. Um, <laughs> the googly eyes. Uh. The water buffalo horns, yeah. Uh, this is one of those that needs to have the eyes way out on the outside edges, like out here. Uh, like um, now, it looks like the uh, it's a trap. Uh, the Star Wars character, right? Um, and then uh, you can you should be able to a Captain Crunch hat, yeah. That's the way I usually think of it. And you, can, you should just be able to type googly, googly. And then the eyes will spin around, and uh, you can uh, Google them as much as you like. Um, they're the hammerhead diatom, exactly. Uh, and let's see, we could put a mustache on it. I think that would really uh, probably help. Um, what about this mustache? Oh, that's the normal one. Uh, what We did that one earlier. What about this bushy mustache? Yeah, a good bushy mustache. Uh, well, I do have a question though, which is, um, which way does the mustache go? I'm, I'm a little confused. I feel like this is the way the mustache goes, but I guess I could, <laughs> Admiral Akbar, exactly. <laughs> the wall-eyed look. Um, where, what to do with this mustache though? Let's see. Let's give it, first let's get it straight. Uh, I do like the crooked look on the mustache, but maybe not quite so crooked. Uh, no, we need uh, 55, it looks like. Uh, do you think we should do a poll? Do you think it should be like a little mustache right here? I kind of like that look. Uh, or should it be a big mustache? You know, like this. No. Okay. Opposed to that. Uh, the other question I have is, um, what about? Uh, I'm tr I'm trusting Studio to give us the right answers because um, uh, she's our our artist in the channel. But what about this? No, because I'm confused which way the mustache goes. You're the artist, yeah. Uh, but could the mustache go this way? Because look at that. You don't think so? But what about it? No? Because I feel like it could. That is a smiley 
Look at the smile. Look at the smile. I feel like it could. Uh, you're opposed to that. Okay. Well, I'm aware. That's totally fine. Uh, I feel like we can trust you. We will have to trust you uh, with the right answer. Oh, wait, it was 55. Uh, look, exactly, look at how happy he is. Uh, although, he looks pretty happy this way as well, to be honest. And I really do think he looked better with a little tiny mustache. You know, just like here or here. Here? Here. I feel like it goes there. Somewhere in that range. Tiny. The tinier, the better. He looks funnier the tinier I make it. <laughs> it's like uh, it, he needs I needed to use the one with the monocle uh, he needs a monocle is what he really needs because I think that is classy he looks very classy um, perfect okay good uh, makes him look like Sid the Sloth from Ice Age it does it very much does Mooch good observation okay um, I think this is a great place to stop uh, I feel like we've had a lot of fun. I've looked through some slides. Um, we've had a great conversation dealing with both science and fun stuff. Um, uh, and I've managed to uh, run my voice uh, even though I've had this really stuffy uh, sounding uh, vocal fry all night. Um, I still managed to make it work. Um, question is who to attack. Uh, I have choices, and my choices are science ones, um, science streams, who are these slides are probably going to go to, uh, Glorgana, who is doing some after dark monarch caterpillar uh, work, artwork, um, and that's it. We got those two choices. Oh, and Freckled Science. Those are my primary uh, recommendations. Um, so if anybody has a strong preference, um, I'm willing to listen. Um, any of those would be fine. Um, for where to send people. And then uh, we'll call it an evening. Um, a very fun evening. Um, it's like 1230 here. And um, I have to get up early in the morning and take my daughter to school, like a responsible parent. So, Diatom's attack is live. Well, I don't know that guy very well. I don't follow him. Um, let's see. Where to go? Where to go? Uh, caterpillar art? Butterflies? Oh, is this butterflies in a microscope? And microscopy. I think maybe we should go visit uh, Freckled Science. I feel like that's a good choice. She's doing butterflies in a microscopy. Uh, she's in our wheelhouse. And um, we should have science streams, I think, on my channel next week. So um, we have good overlap with all of them. But I haven't rated Freckled Science in a while. So why don't we give our friend Freckled Science the raid? Um, feel free to uh, attack her like crazy. Um, and uh, she's doing microscope stuff with butterflies. It sounds perfect. And she's on the west coast, so she's going to be there a little bit longer than probably anybody else. Um, and still active for a while. So um, I want to thank a bunch of people. We've had a really great stream uh, with a lot of action. Um, we got googly eyes from Chippy Flip and, uh, and a mustache. Um, we had uh, community gift subs out of Chippy Flip. We gave five of them. Um, we had a raid from our friend Crossover Carissa. She brought in seven viewers. Um, a very great musician. You should definitely um, give her a listen. We had a subscription from our new friend uh, Gerbo Potato. Thank you very much, Gerbo, as well. You and Chippy Flip are heroes for the evening. Um, a follow from Mooch, who just gave us his first comment. Um, we had a bunch of people just using the rewards in the channel, which is cool. User plus number um, shared uh, 100 bits. Um, as I mentioned, very, uh, very much appreciative of any money people bring into the channel that we use for student research. 
um, and um, Krautfang and Claw also a hundred bits. Um, we got a subscription from Alt Miss Frizzle um, that's subscribed as well, uh, a teacher who's probably going to use some of his stuff for uh, content. We had a huge raid um, from Paleontologizing early on, and uh, I want to thank all those people. So I'll start with that, and we'll catch you next time.